We'll be starting up in about uh, a little over four minutes. Letting folks uh, log in. We know there's quite a few of you today, so. Good morning, we'll be starting up in about three minutes. You may wanna log in and uh, download Poll Everywhere either on an app or go to the website. We're gonna be using that extensively throughout the course of the day. You can open up your chat pod and get a direct link so you don't have to type it in, you can just click. Starting up in about two minutes. Again, you may want to download polyv.com or go to the website. And uh, there are some handouts. We will be putting those in the chat pod if you didn't get them via email yet. Uh, they're on our box folder. If you have a problem getting in because of firewall issues, uh, send us an email to our, uh, and we can try to help you out there. You can just search for New York State LTAP or Cornell Local Roads and our website comes up or you can just email us at clrp at cornell.edu and we can get that sent over to you. I'll mention this again, someone's asking the Q&A about uh, recordings. We will be recording the first three hours and 15 minutes to the conclusions. There will be a Q&A at the end. We won't be recording that, just so you know. But that, there will be a link and we'll email that out to all the participants once we have it. And you're welcome. So good morning and uh, welcome to our workshop, online workshop on local federal aid 101. We're gonna do an, an overview of the process for local federal aid. And we know there's a lot of folks online today. So we'll start with some logistics. I'm David Orr. I'm the director here at the New York State LTAP program. We're at the Cornell Local Roads program here in foggy Ithaca, New York. It's a good day to be on an inside kind of activity. We will be using polls uh, throughout the day. So pollev.com. We'll give you more instructions on that as we get started and practice in a little bit. We also will be using some other tools. We'll talk about those here in just a second. 
the uh, bottom of your screen, you can open that up, check your audio settings, open up your chat pod. The chat pod is disabled for putting in things, but that's where we're gonna put links for handouts, links to Paul EV. We may send a comment in or there, okay? The raise hand feature, I may ask you to raise your hands now and then, okay? Um, so just to, as an example, we'll see if everybody can just go over and raise your hand just to see how many people uh, know where that is. As soon as we get about a hundred or so, we'll ask you to stop so it does keep growing. And watch this, and magically, I'm gonna have everybody's hands lowered, my hands are up. And that's because I've got some great support behind me with uh, Amanda Link monitoring things, Adam Howell, who's off right now, and Melissa Foley. And of course, we have our other staff, Barbara, Jeff, and Nick. Makes my job much easier to have them helping out. The Q&A is also available for you to put in your questions. If you can't get to the poll EV, or if you just have a question about sound, or you want access to something, you need us to email you the handouts because you've got a firewall issue or something like that. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get started. I'll come to the agenda in just a minute, but I wanna start with a brief introduction and see who's here this morning, okay? Again, we're gonna be using polyv.com slash David or PE. That's uh, my handle or whatever you wanna call it that PolyV has let me have, okay? And that's me driving the boat. So as we drive down this thing together, we'll be going uh, things like that, okay? And then uh, before we get moving, the links in the chat are being blocked by the New York State DOT server. We've had this issue in the past. The best way for you to get around that if you can't is send us an email, okay? Uh, that email will, um, Amanda, why don't you put an email link in the chat so people can get that email and make sure you let us know you need the two handouts for today. That's probably gonna be the easiest way to do it. And it's clrp at cornell.edu. Okay, so let's go through a poll EV, see who's on today. We have a huge crowd, there's 300 of you. So let's see how we have, we're gonna start with who you work for. We have town, county, city or village, state or federal, tribal, a consulting firm, engineering consultant, a contractor or the weekend. So let's see who people work for here, okay? And we got quite a variety. We have at least 1% of you that are an honest bunch of folks. Okay, that's good to know, okay. Wow, nice variety. Okay, this is good. So we got people all over the place in terms of state and federal. We know there's a lot of folks from New York City that registered, so that's good to see. Okay. Now, where in the state are you from? You can actually take your mouse and click, or if you have the app, click on your phone or your iPad and click where you're from. So let's see where people are from. And we expect more people from urban areas just based looking at the registration list. And sure enough, that's what I'm seeing. Okay. That will give people a little bit of time to see what we've got here. And we have a few swimmers in Lake Ontario. The ice is out, so hopefully you're doing a, a nice slow crawl there. Okay. <laughs> uh, somebody up in Georgian Bay. Probably cold water up there. They might still have ice. And then what is your job title? This is how helpful to me to know who's on today. Are you an administrator? Are you a highway superintendent or DPW commissioner? Are you an engineer? Are you in the field crew? I don't expect many of them today. Are you a town supervisor or a board member? Uh, or if you're none of the above. Now, if you are none of the above, do me a favor and throw your title into the Q&A so I can just get a sense of who's on today. It helps me. I see a lot of you are engineers today. That's good to know. And it's going to help me as I'm talking how we might flavor particular answers or particular questions. Okay, we have an MPO director. Okay. A landscape architect. Okay, so more of the engineering style. Okay. We have uh, some people who've listed engineer even for other, but okay. Okay, so that gives me some transportation analysis. Okay, we at least have one regional local project liaison, RLPO. We'll come back to the danger of acronyms in a minute. Okay, good, good to know. Okay, thank you. So what is our agenda today? Well, we are firm believers that the mind can absorb what the butt can endure. So we're not gonna 
stay on too long at a time. We're going to do one hour chunks. So this first hour, we're going to be talking about an introduction of the workshop today, the roles of the different parties when there is federal aid. We'll take a break, 15 minutes. We're then going to do planning and design portion, take a lunch break for an hour, come back, talk about construction, operations, and maintenance, take our last break, and come back and finish up with some conclusions. After the conclusions are done, you definitely want to stay on. We're going to have a Q&A panel with folks from New York State DOT and the Federal Highway Administration. Now, everything up to that point, we're going to record it. We will post it online. You're welcome to go back and review it. We're not going to do the Q&A. Um, we don't want someone to take it. You know, we misstate something. We certainly don't want folks to take a wrong impression. So we're going to record everything up to the end of the conclusions, and we'll post that online and send everybody a link. We should be done around 3 o'clock. And who, here's who's on our panel today. We have folks with Local Programs Bureau with New York State DOT, Office of Civil Rights, Office of Environment, Diversity and Opportunity, um, and then Diane Keneally, who oversees both the Local Programs Bureau and the Office of Integrated Modal Services. From Federal Highway, we have a Director of Engineering, a Civil Rights Specialist, and our Local Project Programs Manager, who we know is actually having to flit on and off because like all of us, she's got lots of other things on her plate. Now, for those Q&A, we're gonna hopefully get the questions from you. And we're gonna give you three ways to do it, okay? The best way is put it into this poll EV that will come up. I will show this each time we have a break, I'll make this the active poll. So you can put in your questions um, and then we'll go back and record those questions later on and try to get them answered during that last 45 minutes. We can also, uh, take them in the Q&A if you can't access pollev.com for some reason. We can take care of it that way, okay? And then finally, if you don't have a question, you could always email it to us and we can get back to you later on. So at this point, we're going to move on and we're going to start with a caveat, okay? Now, it's two caveats. The first one has to do with the new Infrastructure Investment and Job Act, Jobs Act, IIJA, some people call it. A lot of other people are calling it the bipartisan infrastructure law, or bill. And of course, I grew up in an era where Bill was a cartoon character sitting on the steps of the Capitol. So Bill is our character for the day. Um, there's a lot of things that came out of Bill that you may have heard about, including provisions for direct local federal aid. That is not today's discussion. I will mention a couple of other times during the day some of the things that may be coming down the pike. But be aware, take, be patient. All of the ducks aren't in a row for that. There's still a lot of things that have to be put in place to make that work. The new appropriations bill that was passed like last week will help move some of these projects along, but there's a process that has to be followed. So we're gonna be focusing on aid that goes through the State Department of Transportation today, but just so you're aware. The other caveat is I'm gonna to try to cover everything I'm not going to claim I know the entire local programs manual. That's why we have the Q&A at the end of the day. If you hear something, please ask, because you might help somebody else who has a similar question. Okay? Now, I apologize now. I will try not to do it. I will try to, if I say an acronym, to make sure you know what it means before I move on. Okay? I may miss that. In your handout, okay, you actually have a listing of the acronyms that I came across that I think you probably need to learn. The nice thing about that, if you know all the acronyms, and by the way, if you're wondering, it's on page four. If you know and write down all those acronyms, you're probably gonna be in pretty good shape to know um, most of what you need to know to do local federal aid. Just learning those acronyms is a good way to sort of remind yourself of what's important. And we'll go back and have a little fun with acronyms at the end of the day, depending on how time it works. Okay. So again, the handout, and the materials, um, they're available on the web, but we can email them to you. I'm not going to try to have you write that down. So just if you can't access it, just let us know. We'll find a way to get you that. The chat pod is up. It has the links in it. Um, we'll go from there. Now on the list of references, I really think if you had to pick one that I would go to beyond the local programs manual, which we're gonna be doing a lot on today, is open up the Federal Aid Essentials videos. 
there goes a link. It's also in the handout. And you can go through and get a lot of really good information to help you through the process. Not just the overview we're going to be doing today, but specific steps, questions about disadvantaged businesses, questions about, you know, commercially useful functions or audit processes, things like that. So there's some good stuff there. Definitely worth some time to go through and watch a few of the videos. And if you have any questions on any of them, please don't hesitate to ask. Now, why are we doing this? Well, we got data from the Local Programs Bureau for the years 2016 to 2019, okay? And I went through and I pulled out New York City not because New York City isn't important, but I was just trying to not have this big circle that dominated everything else. So of the projects that got local federal aid that went through the State Department of Transportation, um, 654 local projects over four years. So obviously a little over 150 per year. 247 different local agencies. And as you can see, this is a map showing where they are by county. So there's county, cities, towns, and villages that have gotten these projects. Counties, when you look at it and you break it down, counties had 54 projects during that time frame. okay? So 31 of the counties, most of the counties had five or more. They're probably pretty familiar with the process, okay? And uh, Melissa's trying to take care of some noise issues for me. So thanks, Melissa. Uh, three to four counties had 11, um, excuse me, 11 counties had three to four. So in other words, most of the county projects were done by counties that had quite a few. But there were a few, a couple of counties, six, they only had one, six, they only had two. If you don't do this very often, it's easy to forget the process, okay? Similar rule for cities. Now, a lot of cities, this is outside New York City, so it'd be 13 if I included them had five or more projects. You're probably pretty familiar if you've had five or more projects. But if you only had one in four years, things change. I can tell you right now, things are changing pretty rapidly and will change even more quickly as information comes out with the bill. Bill, Okay. Uh, towns, 108 different towns out of the 933 towns in the state got federal aid in that four-year cycle. But most of those towns had one or two projects at best. Okay, so if you're a town and you're thinking, I'm going to go get some federal aid, you need to understand the process, but you may not do it that often. And again, a similar story when we look at the villages. Not many villages get it, and we'll talk about why as we go through the course of the day. Another way to think about it is the old rule about the 80-20. You know, 80% of your issues are by 20% of your problems. <laughs> okay, in this case, almost 80% of the projects are done by 20% of the local municipalities. What we're aiming at, what we're talking about today really in a lot of ways is everybody else. Those who've had no or very few federal aid projects to help you understand the process so you go in with eyes wide open, okay? So another way to break that down is, you know, about a quarter of the projects are done by people who've done their first project in quite a while or maybe ever. Okay. So what I want to know from you is, and again, this helps me, how many federal aid projects have you completed? And your choices are none. One, two, three, four, five to nine, or 10 or more. Okay. So this helps me out. How many projects have you got? Okay. Okay, so we got quite a spread. And again, if you can't get the poly V for some reason, you can throw it in the Q&A and I've got a five in the Q&A. So if you can't do the Q&A, that helps. Okay, you got 10 or more. I hope for those of you who have the five to nine and two or more, you'll pick up one or two things or maybe some things that have changed in the last year or two as we're coming out of COVID. But for those of you who are the zeros and ones, that you're really the primary audience today. And I'm hoping you'll pick up a lot and realize there's actually quite a bit of help out there. You're not alone. There's people to talk to and get help from, okay? Now, just for the sake of argument, what kind of projects have you done, okay? Just one word, two words, bridge, safety, you know, yeah, simple 
just to see what kind of projects people are doing. Okay, a lot of bridges are probably gonna pop up, bridge and highway, bridge replacement, street reconstruction, culvert, okay? Trail intersections, yeah. A preventive maintenance street thing, okay, safety, okay? So all kinds of projects are out there. It's amazing how many different things there is for federal aid. There's reconstruction, there's safety. We'll talk about eligibility here in a little bit. A ferry boat, I see in the Q&A, that's pretty cool, okay. Uh, as we were developing and looking at this, we got some sent to us. People rebuild old uh, railroad uh, facilities, terminals in some cases, so pretty cool stuff. Okay, so again, here's your chance. Before, everybody had none at this time, but again, this is the time, anytime you see this, this is where you put in, I've got a question. And if you've got it, you'll be able to put it into here. And I'll be showing this again. Each time we come to a break, I'll make this live active poll so you can put in your questions, okay? Now, during the course of the day, I'm gonna have two sort of shadow projects that we're gonna sort of keep in the back of our mind as we're following along, okay? One is imagine that we're gonna be rehabilitating or even replacing a bridge, so a bridge project. Every bridge is technically eligible for federal aid. Um, whether it's competitive or not, that's a different question, but bridge projects are the most common by far for federal aid at the local level. So we'll put a bridge project in there. But I don't want to forget about safety, okay? That could be an additional sidewalks, getting people to school. It could be an ADA issue. It could be putting in a mini roundabout. But safety is always eligible, okay? There's some caveats, of course, but safety is always eligible. So we'll also talk about maybe some safety projects as our two projects as we walk through the course of the day. So we'll keep that in mind as we move forward and, and we'll go from there, okay? Now, back to our friend, the bill, okay? You will have heard of things such as the Rebuilding American Infrastructure Sustainability and Equitability, RAISE, yeah, we love our acronyms, and things like the Infrastructure for Rebuilding America, Infra, okay? Safe Streets and Roads for All, Reconnecting Communities, Rural Surface Transportation. These are all components inside of Bill. Some of them have started to be released, but there are a lot more out there. Be patient. If you see something like this, start thinking now because the process takes time anyway but realize that a lot of those funds, you're gonna to need to go get help to figure out what's eligible and help to figure out the whole process. So I just want you to realize there's lots of tools out there. Now, when we were developing uh, another version of this kind of federal aid class on construction, we found this project development project process from the New York State Department of Transportation. It sort of looks like the game of life, if you remember the game of life, which I guess is now electronic, it's actually a pretty good way to sort of walk through the process. It's not quite exactly the same as the federal aid process. You can adapt it for your own use, but it's a pretty good reminder. There's a lot of little details on it. And I know what you're thinking. You're all thinking the same thing right now. You're going, the font's too small, I can't read it. I know, I don't expect you to read it. Don't try to read it. The figure is in the handout. Anytime I've given you something, there's either a link or the figure is in the handout. So. Hopefully everything you need to read is nice big letters. Okay, don't wanna make it hard on you. Now you can break this down. They did it by color, but you could break it down by words. There's a planning phase. There's a scoping phase for the project. There's design, construction. And then at the end there's operations and maintenance and we'll start the cycle anew, okay? Now Federal Highway, the Federal Highway Administration, FHWA, not FHA, you'll see people do that. That's a different federal agency, that's a housing group. But FHWA has their own federal aid project flow chart, okay? And it's a little bit different, okay? So, you know, they've got a planning phase, they've got a scoping phase, which is the programming and then clearance phase. They've got something called final PSE or plan specifications and estimates, something we come back to quite a bit. Then you construct it letting process and construction. And then finally they do audits and they hand it off to the agency that did the work, whether it's a state or a local. 
It's the same process, just slightly different words. Planning, scoping, design, construction, operations and maintenance. And so as we go through the process, this is sort of the process we're gonna use. Now, one of the handouts you've got, and it's actually one of my, uh, it's really a good handout, is a wheel that was put together by the local programs folks at the New York State Department of Transportation, where they talk about the federal aid highway reimbursement process. And again, I know the font is too small and you can't read it, but there's a figure in your handout on the main handout. And we also provided to you a series of sheets that they put together that step through all of these different steps in the process. It's really well done. When we went through and tried to do some editing, we realized there's just some minor tweaks we wanted to do, uh, clean up a font here and there. Um, but other than that, it's really a good read and it's a good reminder as you're going through the steps to not miss something because I'm a huge fan of checklists. I hate paperwork, but folks know that. But the idea is help you through the process, give you some steps, the wheel as, as it were, okay? To summarize, we're gonna start with our planning, which is to plan and identify the project. We're gonna go get funding. Before you go any further, you need to have a project agreement. Okay, that's still in the planning phase. Then once you get past that, you're gonna hire a consultant and you're gonna scope everything out, okay? Now that's one step on the wheel that was provided from NYSDOT, but it's really pretty important to scope it well. We'll talk about that, okay? And then design, design's a lot of steps. That's because each time we do preliminary design or detailed design, we have to get approvals. We have to acquire property during this phase. And then finally, we have authorization to construct. We have construction phase, close the project out, and then it goes to O&M. And the reason it's a circle is because reality is we're eventually gonna have to come back and look at these things again, okay? Now, let's see, we have a question over here. Um, has anyone in the United States of America petitioned the FHWA and in our case, nice dot to simplify the process? This is a lot. Um, I will tell you right now, this is one of the things about federal aid, just to realize the process is the same pretty much for any federal aid project, okay? There are some differences and we'll talk about those between small and big projects, but from a local agency perspective, Yes, there is a similar process, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have Amanda throw this into our questions. We'll go in the Q&A at the end of the day because I think it's a good one to remind ourselves about. But yeah, we know it's a big process and it's gonna take some time to go through it, which is why before you go get federal aid, I want you to have your eyes wide open. Is it worth it? There's actually good reasons for doing this process. And it's especially important on big projects. But at some point, it may be better off to not go fighting for the local federal aid, okay? Now, the other thing to remind you of is federal aid is a reimbursement program. You know, they say, what came first, the chicken or the egg? In this case, it's the chicken. You have to upfront and pay the contractor. You have to pay all the subs, or they have to pay the subs, but you have to upfront the funds. Now, it's not 100% that you'd have to upfront because it takes time and you'll get some reimbursements back from the state. We'll talk about that process, but it's a reimbursement program. You have to upfront, okay? And before you do that, you have to have authorization to do so. So it has to be authorized ahead of time, okay? And we'll definitely talk about that during the course of the day, but keep that in mind, it's a reimbursement program. Now that reimbursement, it goes from the contractor all the way up to the Federal Highway Administration. So how does that work? Well, contractor, they perform the work, okay? Then the sponsor pays the contractor. In the case of a local project, that's the local agency, okay? And the sponsor then says to New York State DOT, hey, we need to get reimbursed for the money we paid the contractor and New York State reimburses the sponsor. New York State then goes and asks for reimbursement from the Federal Highway Administration, okay? And so to look at this, you can just imagine, it's a going back and forth, perform the work, submit the invoice. Sponsor, pay the contractor, ask for the money. 
from the state. State, pay the sponsor, reimbursement request, and then the FHWA reimburses New York State DOT. And each of these steps has to be done in a particular order, otherwise it can stall the process. So it's a reimbursement program. So keep that in mind, okay? I will remind you of this a few times. This has happened to agencies. It's not a common occurrence, but it can happen. Don't go to the next step until you have the authorization. Stop, be patient, okay? So you have to have authorizations before you can move on to the next step. And not just the big project steps, but he's sometimes within a particular step. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna walk you through the project steps and make sure we're on the same page with our planning, our scoping, our design, our construction, and our operations and maintenance, okay? Now, someone asked how many people are from New York City. Um, we know there were over 100 registered. I don't know how many are on there. We could look that up, but uh, there, there were over 100 who were registered, we know, at one point. Now, you could do this process via this program, uh, project development process from NYSDOT. You could use the wheel from local programs, both work. Uh, we provided you with both. You can choose your own. I don't have a strong opinion about which is gonna be better. I like to sort of actually look at both because it's a different perspective in both cases. And remember, be careful of acronyms. There is almost an entire page and I didn't even come close to listing all of them. I just list the most common acronyms. So we'll go along there in the course of the day and we'll definitely be playing around with different acronyms. In fact, our first acronym that I haven't mentioned yet is something you'll hear me say called the LPM, okay? So let's see in the q and I'm not gonna do a poll in this one. What do you think LPM stands for? What do we think LPM? Local project management. Okay, local programs manual actually. It's the local programs manual. This is the paper process that you need to be looking at. You need to get familiar with the local programs manual. It is a link in the handout and you can download that information and look through it. And that's where a lot of the stuff we're talking about today come from. Now to understand this, we're gonna be looking at chapter two and we're gonna talk about the roles and responsibility of the Federal Highway Administration, the New York State Department of Transportation, and the sponsor. And just like our cinnamon rolls that we put in the oven, if we work together closely, we rise more, we do a better job. So we need to understand the roles, but we also need to communicate and work with each other. So let's start with the Federal Highway Administration. They are part of the US Department of Transportation, okay? And this is something that they provided to us, a whole bunch of slides. And this is one of the slides they provided don't normally put a lot of text on, but I want to read this because it's a pretty important one. The primary role of federal highway with local dollars that they're sending out from federal aid is to ensure recipients of federal aid deliver the program, which includes project delivery, in an efficient, effective, and compliant manner with the federal requirements. Okay? So their primary role is to be efficient, effective, and compliant, and they have to do all three. And it's a balancing act which I think they would admit is not always easy because sometimes to make sure people are compliant with the regulations and the rules, it feels like it's not very efficient or it's not very effective. But think of it this way. Um, the state of California had, was about to drop their program for testing rebar. They literally were gonna drop their testing QA, QC program. We'll come back to what QA, QC stands for in a little bit, I promise. They were gonna drop their program because they'd never had a failure of rebar in 20 plus years. And finally, somebody convinced them and reminded them, you know, that's because they had a good program that was efficient, effective, and ensured compliance. That's why they had no failures. So a good program will give you all three. It's not always an easy process to do, but that's the primary role of the Federal Highway Administration. That is done at the state level by the division. They don't call them state offices because that would be confusing. They call them division offices. So when you hear the term FHWA division, that's the New York division. They're based out of Albany. They're right across from the Palace Theater downtown in the federal building down there, okay? 
They administer the federal aid program here in New York State. They also provide technical assistance, primarily to the State Department of Transportation, especially when it comes to local projects. Okay, so as the State Local Programs Bureau develops the local projects manual, they work to make sure that it's going to be compliant with the requirements and try to be as efficient and effective as possible. They do come in, they do conduct reviews because they have a responsibility for stewardship of the money, just like we all do at the governmental level. They provide some oversight to make sure that technical stuff, engineering level activities are done meeting the requirements for bridges and safety and other activities. So they do conduct reviews. A lot of that work is done through what they're called area engineers, okay? Um, when they're fully staffed, they have eight area engineers around the state. Uh, I know they're not fully staffed at this point, so like all of us, they're short staffed and happen to scramble a little bit. But that area engineer is the primary project contact, contact for New York State DOT, but they focus on areas of risk, bigger projects, projects that have a little bit more risk for either an engineering reason or a financial reason. So they're looking at the bigger projects mostly. And they're looking at procedures more than they're looking at the technical stuff, just so you're aware of that. But they do sometimes get involved in technical activities. I know that for sure. Okay, so be aware of that. They can maintain awareness of the project status. And if you do a good job of communicating, it's usually a pretty easy to work with those area engineers. They're not validating the technical and computational aspects. Okay, so just that's done by engineers, not the area engineer for Federal Highway. So they're trying to make sure that the project goes through, uh, has a good plan all the way through. So their involvement in the division is at the project level. They're always updating their project involvement process. Okay, they used to have a thing called the project of division interest with a bunch of categories. They've dropped the categories now. They're going to be using a risk based system rather than a category based system. And that means that every project will get looked at in the concept of a stewardship and oversight plan to make sure that it's got a procedure from beginning to end that's gonna make some sense, okay? Unlike our friends here in uh, London who were putting in security ballots with quick set cement. And as they were cleaning up the truck, they realized that their quick set cement had already cemented and gotten hard. We want a good plan. And that's one place where Federal Highway can actually help by looking things over to see is there something that might've gotten missed. Now, those plans that are developed are project specific, okay? So they do a, a risk assessment on those projects, which takes time. That's part of the reason we need to have time for these things. Things they may actually do at Federal Highway, they may have some extra oversight activities. They may get involved in some of the approvals, not all of them, and it depends on the project and the size of it. But their primary thing, remember, is efficiency, effectiveness, and compliance. Are we using the federal dollars? To meet the standards and meet the requirements. Now, there may be something called a compliance assessment program or CAP that you may hear about. Okay. This is essentially they're looking at to make sure everything's being complied with. Okay. For a particular project, you may hear something called a FIRE, Financial Integrity Review and Evaluation. And again, we love our acronyms. These are just things they're doing to check the process. Don't, don't get worried about them unless you think you've done something crazy, but more importantly, they're just ways to communicate, okay? They're gonna be involved throughout the process at Federal Highway. So you definitely make sure they're included when they need to be included, but most of the time you're gonna be talking to the State Department of Transportation. They do program element reviews when it comes to different projects. Now, I got two slides I'm gonna show you and they're upside down from each other. So just want you to be aware of that. Slide one is a slide we got from Federal Highway that talks about the hierarchy of federal aid requirements. And they're looking at it from the standpoint of the top of the pyramid is the law, okay? Such as the new bill, okay? And then into that they'll write a series of regulations. And from those regulations, they may develop some policies that have to be followed, okay? and then you're gonna get some guidance on the policies, and then there's a ton of information that comes out beyond that. So for instance, the uh, FAST Act, um, which is the last bill that we had, and is still 
controlling a lot of projects that are still going on. That would be the law. And then you might have the code of federal regulations. And then below that, you might have a stewardship and oversight policy that comes out. You might have guidance on how to do things such as buying American or how do you move utilities. And then of course, there's lots of information and the project reports and things like that. So that's one way to look at it. I'll give you a different way. This is my spin. It's my spin only, okay? So I actually say, well, you know, everything we actually do comes from the base of the Constitution. So I'm gonna flip it upside down. On top of the Constitution, there's the law. The law is like Bill or the FAST Act. Same step, we're gonna still have regulations and policies, but then we're gonna have above that guidance, and then we're gonna have information. Most of the information that comes with a project really comes in the form of either an agreements or a contract. The agreements might be between Federal Highway and a sponsor or between New York State and a sponsor. Okay, in our case, it's New York State and a sponsor, local agency. And then there may be paperwork beyond that, but really you wanna start at the bottom and work your way up. It's the same idea, it's just a different spin. Do we have our constitution? Maybe we have a law. Some laws are pretty old, you know, hundreds of years. They're still on the books. In the case, for instance, of traffic signs, there's still some laws that are 60, 70 years old, but there's a regulation on signs and there can actually be conflicts. So we have to be careful about that. Okay. And of course, states may have their own things they put on top of the regulations. There may be a policy that's put in place, like some local agencies don't do children at play signs. Some do, okay? And then you may find guides. Sometimes the guides are official documents. Sometimes they're just training documents like we put out, okay? And then you're gonna have agreements or contracts. So remember, there's always a hierarchy on all of these things. And this is really Federal Highway's role in a lot of ways to make sure that we're remembering that process. However, we flip our pyramid, okay? Now, the other thing I want to talk about is the role and responsibility of the State Department of Transportation, okay? They are going to make sure that the projects are eligible for federal aid before we move the process forward. So that's one of the things they look at. Does this meet the requirements? Do you have enough traffic? Is it on a federal aid road for certain types of funding? They're going to make sure that as the project is done, it's compliant with federal and state requirements. And of course, they want to protect the investment. We want to make sure the dollars are being spent well. The processes and all of this come from the guidance document, or you could call it a policy document. We could argue about that, but the local projects manual or the LPM, okay? Now for the local sponsors, you're going to be getting technical assistance from the regional office. And to do that, you're going to be dealing with the RLPL, and I guarantee you, you will hear that acronym used a lot when you start talking to folks. RLPL is the single most important contact you'll have if you have federal aid. That is the Regional Local Project Liaison, RLPL, okay? They're the people who help you interpret the manuals and the guidelines. They help make sure you're compliant, there's a consultant in some respects between uh, main office and the regions. They can even talk to Federal Highway. They help you with local program agreements. And the most important thing to do is to know their email and their phone number. And pick up the phone and give them a holler, okay? The RLPL works for the State Department of Transportation at the regional level. So there's an RLPL in every single region of the state, okay? So they are state employee, okay? So they're part of the NYSDOT. Now, of course, they work with the folks in main office, okay? The local programs bureau, which is at uh, Wolf Road. This is a picture from Google Street View, okay? They're up there in the upper left corner, okay? On the, uh, on the top floors. The local programs bureau deals with a lot of the federal aid process, but also state aid. This is where CHIPS funds come from, for instance, through that local programs bureau. So, this is a pretty important group. They write the local projects manual. They put out any of the policies and guidance, and they're the ones who make sure that the checks get distributed, both for state aid and for federal aid for local projects. So pretty important group there. And they are the ones who came up with that wheel 
document that we give you as a handout. And again, it's a pretty good document. I would advise you, in fact, you get a chance, to read the wheel, then open up the local programs, projects manual, okay? So we're gonna open up a poll everywhere. I'm gonna come back to this question later on, again, just like the Q and A thing, but for those who have had federal projects, and a lot of you have, give me some examples of things where you've had to get approval from New York State DOT before you move on. By the way, dad is not just your father. Dad is a design agreement, okay? We'll come back to dad here in a little bit. But notice what you're seeing. You're seeing a bunch of acronyms, okay? I've got one in the uh, Q&A, AEW and FCP. The Transportation Research Board meets every single year and they have committees. And there's a lady who used to run one of the committee sections. She always liked to say, we should never use the uh, letter codes for the names of the committees because nobody knows them. And it's even worse now because during COVID they changed all the numbers. I have no clue what the numbers are. If you're new, try to use the full names, okay? Because PMP to me is a poor man's pizza, okay? But the idea is there's lots of things that you have to have approval for, okay? They're gonna be reviewing things such as DBE issues, right-of-way clearances, grant design approvals, okay? And we will come back to a list of those examples as we get through the course of the day. Hopefully those of you who are new will start to pick up some of the acronyms and start to understand some of the things that Federal Highway and New York State DOT are approving, okay? Now let's finish our discussion uh, before we take our first break and let's talk about the sponsor. That's the terminology you'll see everywhere. They call it the sponsor. In our case, that means the local agency, whether that's New York City, Yates County, the town of Wyndham, the local agency, okay? And some people say you're nuts to get federal aid. Depends on the project. I think it's actually a pretty good thing and it has some value to it if you understand that. But the key is knowing the process. The local agency has the same kind of roles and responsibility as does Federal Highway and New York State DOT, okay? First person that you need to have is somebody who's called a responsible local official. This is usually the elected official who signs off on the agreements, okay? Town supervisor, mayor, uh, the head of the county legislature. It could be assigned somebody, it could be a deputy mayor, it could be uh, head of the transportation committee for a county, okay? So it's the responsible local official who signs off that yes, the financial stuff, we would be responsible, we'll upfront the payments to get reimbursed, things like that, okay? There's a project manager. I will come back to a lot more discussion about the project manager, but the one thing I want you to walk away with is the project manager has to be a full-time employee working for the local agency, okay? Has to be a full-time employee, okay? Now, you're gonna also have an engineer in charge or a resident engineer who's on site with the project. That could be a consulting firm, that could be a employee of the sponsor of the local agency, okay? They're gonna be the person who's on site making sure the project gets executed properly. There's gonna be inspectors, and depending on the size of the project is how many inspectors you need to have, and we'll talk more about that number here in a little bit, okay? So this is the people that you need to have on board. Again, a lot of people hire consultants to take care of the engineer in charge or the resident engineer, they hire firms to do the inspection, though you can do it with your own forces, but the project manager has to be a person working for the agency and it needs to be somebody a responsible local official. Again, an elected person typically. So the project manager, always full-time person. Now, again, I'm not gonna open up a poll on this one, but in the Q and A, can you tell me why do you think that is a requirement that the local agency have a full-time employee who is the project manager. Uh, 
Uh, question here while we're waiting for that. Does a responsible local official have to be elected or they can be employed? They could be an employee, but they have to be assigned that duty by the elected board. The elected board will have to take action because remember, there's a budgetary responsibility or financial responsibility. So the board has to take some positive action, okay? So the person who signs off on it has to be given that power by the board. So the board has to take action at some point, which is why typically it's the mayor or the supervisor or the head of the legislature who officially signs the uh, responsible local official, okay? Um, yes, so good answers here for project manager. It gives one point of contact. That's incredibly important. And more importantly, it's one point of contact that's always working, that's available, okay? So that they know who that is, okay? Now, somebody is trying to say, you know, maybe consultants, it's hard to know who you're talking to. The bigger issue is the consultant um, is working on the project, but their primary responsibility is to be the consultant, okay? Like it or not, someone who works for the agency, that's their primary focus. They work for the agency, okay? And that's a pretty important thing to take care of. Gives continuous coordination. They are vested in the project. Yep, good answers here, okay? Okay, let's see if there's any other good answers. Oversure and compliance, that's a good one. That way they're available if they're uh, full time, they're accessible. Yep, so all good answers here. Now, someone put in here, one person expected to know the rules for using federal funds. I'll tell you something. It is unlikely, especially on your first project or two, that you're gonna know all of the rules for federal funds. You really wanna have a good consultant or a good group to work with, to talk to, to get help. You're not gonna know all the rules, but you'll know where to look to go get help to know those rules, okay? So, and there's value for having a full-time employee. Now, how many projects can you have? Well, it depends on the size of the project, but typically, you know, a few projects at best, you might have to have multiple people in a big agency who serve as project managers for different projects, okay? So these are all pretty, and it's, it's not a state constitutional issue, okay? It's, it's, a, it's in the policy process, okay? I think we can clear all of these. Is there a cap on federal spending for a month or year? We'll talk about caps on funding in a little bit. So I'm gonna leave that one and actually may come back to it over the course of um, when we do the Q&A, but it depends on the project agreement on how much money you're spending, okay? Now, one of the things that the sponsor is going to be doing is they're gonna be holding a pre-construction meeting. Now that's, by the way, that's three quarters of the way through the process, but it's listed because it's something just to keep in mind that the local sponsor is involved, not just in the getting the money, but all the way through the project, okay? They're gonna make sure that they've got qualified inspection staff, whether they hire them or whether they have them internally. They are gonna ensure compliance, but they don't have to do it alone, okay? They just have to make sure there's some compliance going on. You're gonna be preparing the change orders. And we'll talk a lot more about change orders during this third hour, okay? Change orders are pretty important. We wanna limit the number of them, but they are gonna happen, we know that. They're gonna do a close out of the project at the end, okay? Good news about that, you don't have to remember all of this. It's all documented. There's checklists that will help you go through the process, okay? And this is just a quick, brief summary. There's all kinds of other things that the sponsor is gonna be doing. Obviously, you're upfronting the funds to pay the contractor until you get reimbursed. This means you're gonna to have to submit the reimbursement process. You're gonna be acquiring permits. You're gonna be acquiring right away. We're gonna be talking about that over the course of the day. Okay. Now, before I move on, I do want to remind you of the fact that there are federal requirements not associated with local federal aid. Okay. You have to technically do these on all of your projects, even if you're using only local dollars. So sometimes we hear, oh, that's a federal aid requirement. No, some things 
are required no matter what. For instance, Title VI, non-discrimination, we all know about this, that's required on every project. You have to have policies in place and you need to follow them for discriminating for creed, race, all those other things that are on the list, okay? The Americans with Disabilities Act, okay? You have to follow the ADA, that's another acronym, on all your projects, okay? In fact, we're gonna be holding a session over the summer, a training class on the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's that important. You need to be thinking about that. It's not hard to meet, but it can get you in trouble, okay? And a lot of this is discussed in the local programs, projects manual, local projects manual, chapter 13. But realize it's always required on every single project you do. So you may want to look at that chapter just to be able to see the kind of things you have to do on any project, even if it's local funds. And in terms of link to download the handouts, if you open up your chat pod, there is a link in there, OK? Um, if you don't see it, pop it back in the Q&A and we'll throw it back in there. Sometimes if you came in late, you might not have seen that particular chat, but there should be in the chat pod and there should be an answer on the link. Scour critical bridges. Um, you need to make sure your bridges are being inspected. That's done by the state here in New York, which is, I think, good news, but also checking for scour. You have to go out and make sure that there's not scour issues. And that actually is a remnant a leftover from the Schoharie Bridge collapse in 1987. So this is just a list of three of the biggest ones, but there's tons of things out there. So for instance, with the ADA, you need to have a self-evaluation and transition plan in place for your community before you move forward. And that's true, again, even if you're only using local dollars. To me, the way to think about the ADA though is, Imagine if you were in a wheelchair, like my brother's about to be because he broke his ankle for a while, or you had a hard time walking a long distance uh, for whatever reason, would you be able to get around your community? If you can say yes to that, then you probably got a pretty good plan. There's some really good stuff on self-evaluation out there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel and some good links in the local pro projects manual. Um, Question here, who inspects pedestrian bridges? If it's over a public road, it would actually be inspected by the state. But we have pedestrian bridges over the state road um, and it's inspected by the state. But otherwise it would be inspected by the local agency, okay? So we have some pedestrian bridges here on campus that have to be inspected by the university, okay? We should be treating them the same way we treat our road bridge though, because we don't want people to get hurt. Let's see. Okay, so we are at right now, we are at 1024. So I'm going to start planning. I've got a couple of slides in. Let me just check my location here. I think this will work out really well. Yep, we're going to start the planning process. At the bottom of the hour, we will take our first break. Okay, I'm a firm believer that we'll get you your break time. Okay, now we're going to be planning processes. Again, this is this big wheel that we're in right now. Okay, so we're in the planning phase. That's the light green phase of this. So step one through three and the wheel from your state DOT. Okay, so step one is to plan and identify the project. Okay, so if it's a bridge, hopefully you've got a plan on all of your bridges. You're looking out there when they're going to be worked on. Could be a big culvert. Okay, planning and identifying the projects. Okay, for your safety projects, you could be looking at small ones, it could be large ones. Um, so we'll walk through one of these, but I got a question for you. How long do you take from project inception to construction? Okay, so for a bridge rehab or for putting in a series of crosswalks or speed table, how long would you put in there? <clears throat> okay. This is a very telling slide, by the way. I hadn't even thought about that until I'm looking at the results here. Um, I did a one hour version of this class for the Association of Towns back in February, all board uh, members and supervisors. And I asked them how long they were gonna take from project inception to construction. 
their answers almost the same as the ones you're putting down, except they were flipped up. So about a third were less than a year, about half were one to two years, and most were, you know, about 20% were three to four years. Only a couple of people said five or more. So you're probably more realistic, especially when it comes to federal aid, okay? So it takes time. That's for your own projects, okay? Now, for federal aid projects, it's gonna even add a little bit of time. There's a process involved because remember, you have to have authorization before you do the next step. So add a little bit of time. Some people say double it. Some people say add a year or two. It really depends on the project, but that's one of the reasons I like either the wheel or better yet, I think the nice dot project planning thing, you can sort of walk through the timing for that and see how long you think it's gonna take. To get on the project planning, you have to be part of either the statewide long range plan, you have to get on a MPO's master plan for the 14 MPO's in the state, or you get on regional transportation plans that are done through the State Department of Transportation's regional offices. You can get on those. And then those projects are put onto the transportation improvement plan or the state transportation improvement plan. The tip and the step. Different groups do different things. But the project has to be on there before you can move on. So that's one of the first most important steps. You have to have things approved. So like for instance, Bridge New York, which is a fairly quick turnaround process. Those projects have to be put onto the step before they actually wind up getting released and moved on. That's why they sometimes take a bit of time. I sympathize with the folks at local projects who are getting calls. We need to get out there and get that project going. Well, they got a process they got to follow as well. So, and for those who are in an MPO, this is a map of the location of MPOs in the state. Okay. So those states are all over the place. The MPOs are all over the place. Some are only a county in size, like in Elmira Corning or in uh, Ithaca. Others are large, like the DTSC, which is out of Rochester and serves all the way to Seneca and Yates counties, which are actually in different state regions, okay? And an MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization. Thank you, I said MPO and I should have, I should have done the acronym. You're right, my fault, my bad. Metropolitan Planning Organization. They get some funding to help with planning and analysis and organization of the statewide well, actually the local transportation improvement plan, the TIP, and then they put it onto the statewide plan. They have subcommittees that look at everything from safety to administration to asset management. So they're a pretty good organization. If you're in one of those counties, go find out who your MPO contact is and go have a cup of coffee now that we can do that after COVID. It's definitely worthwhile. So we're going to end with Last thing we're going to do, we're going to take our first break here in just a second, but we're going to end with asking you, if you're developing a project, what would you put on your project description? And after we come back from our break, I'll talk about what is required and what we got or did not get. Okay, so we'll give you about 30 seconds to put in what you think should be on the project description. Okay, and then we'll come back to that slide, and that's what I have to remember to write that down. We are on slide 68, okay. So we've got things like location, project objectives, limits, scope of work, okay, good stuff, okay. It is the bottom of the hour. We are gonna take our break, okay. And I'm gonna activate the what questions do you have slide. Okay, that will now be active. You can add in any questions for the Q&A panel at the end of the day. And we will start back up at 10.30. Not working, there we go. There we go, 10.45. See how I do on my drawing here. 45 is easy. There we go, 10.45. Everybody enjoy your break. We'll see you in 15 minutes.
About two minutes, we'll be starting back up. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get ourselves started back up. We ended with uh, people putting in their thoughts on the project descriptions and what things should include. I did notice somebody put in that some issues with audio. If you're having issues with audio, uh, on the lower left of your screen, there should be a place for you to check your audio settings. Uh, make sure that you're choosing the right speaker. I noticed Zoom sometimes will choose the a device which may not actually be the one you really want to be using. So you may want to manually change it to the one you'd like. Okay. In fact, it may happen today. Our computer sometimes will, my computer will sometimes decide the audio doesn't like me. So if that happens, I'll have to quickly change. Let me know. Okay. And I did have one question coming in the Q&A while we were thinking about it, asking about transportation advisory councils. These are usually done at the local level. They work with either the state DOT and rural areas outside of the MPO regions, or they can be larger groups. If you're in a rural area here in New York, I would actually make sure you contact, if you're not in a metropolitan planning organization area or MPO, contact your local regional planning and development board. And there are lots of those around the state. Or if you're up in the Tug Hill, the Tug Hill Commission, they serve a similar role. And they can help you with coordinating long range planning and developing some of the grants to get federal aid. So that's a place you want to contact again your regional planning and development board, the Southern Tier Central, Southern Tier West is one of the Catskills. So they cover most of the rural areas that are not covered by an MPO. Okay. So now we're going to talk about project description. You had some great ideas in here that are things like location and scope of work what's gonna be accomplished, the project limits, the scope. It'd be nice to have a perfect scope. The reality is you probably can't have the full scope as you're developing and you're trying to apply for funds, okay? Because we're gonna be doing some additional scoping, but it is a good thought. The better you do here, the better off you're gonna be later on. As a minimum, you're gonna want the project description, the location, which includes the municipality and the county. If you're getting federal aid, you're gonna to need to eventually have that included in your project description. So you can leave a blank for that. You're gonna want things such as traffic, type of work. Is it a bridge? Um, is there any environmental issues that you've got to deal with? Okay. So these are all things, there are some requirements that are in there. Um, a good way to think about it, and there's actually a thing sitting in the uh, local projects manual, the LPM, it actually gives you an outline and it actually has a blank project 
report that you can use as a starting point. And here's the things you got to start every report with. Project title and description, such as Route 6 over Keskill Creek or Town Road A over uh, Town Road B, if you actually had that, very unlikely. A project identification number that eventually will get assigned by the state. If there's a bridge, there's always a bridge identification number. And then what is the local agency? Okay, so these are things that would always be in there. Okay. Now, as you're developing in your, your project, again, you're getting ready to go out and you're going to go and apply for federal aid. I can't emphasize this one enough. This is the time to get a good cost estimate. Okay. Now, it's almost impossible to get a perfect estimate because we don't have a final scope. But a good cost estimate is really important. That includes the cost for preliminary design, detailed design, any issues you've got on right of way, anything you've got for property acquisition that you're concerned about, uh, construction, the inspection, any miscellaneous that you're dealing with utility or railroad, do a cost estimate, include everything, okay? And the reason for this is really important. If you're gonna go out and get federal dollars, you're gonna ask for X federal dollars. You may get X federal dollars. You're going along and you realize I missed something. I need more money. It may not be available, okay? You need to have what you need as part of the application so you can get everything that you need, okay? So include everything. And just about everything you do is eligible for federal dollars, as we'll talk. But that means that you've really got to make sure you include it upfront when you're developing your project, okay? And that comes down to something called the project management plan or PMP. This is a requirement, okay? You have to have, there's a form, okay? And, you know, we could walk through that project management plan. We might actually come back and do that towards the end of this hour, depending on our time frame, okay? But there's a sample project management plan form that's available in the LPM. It's really a pretty nice little thing to review, walks you through all the things you need to include. Again, it's a checklist. I'm a big fan of checklist, help us not miss something, okay? You can use this information for your initial project proposal when you're trying to go out and you get your federal aid. It would include things like your milestones, how are you gonna control cost? Who's taking what risk? Who's got what roles and responsibilities, okay? But of course, anybody from Cornell more than 10 years ago thinks of PMP as a hot truck, but they're sadly not here anymore. But the project management plan is a pretty important document and can be used a lot to help you out with development of your grant application as well, okay? So you can actually get a head start, okay? Now there is a state law, um, the New York State Smart Growth Public Infrastructure Policy Act. It has an acronym, but it doesn't really ring a bell, so I'm not going to read it to you. It was put out in 2010. It does require that anytime you're looking at projects and you're trying to go get federal and state aid, that you check to see if it's got some smart growth to it. There's a tool. There's a link in your handout. You don't have to remember all of this. It's just a quick process. Doesn't take that long but it's something to think about as you're developing your project before you go get federal aid, doesn't meet this particular policy act, which is a law, even though it says policy act. So be careful of what's a law versus a policy in this case. So now I've identified my project. I've done a preliminary estimate of what I think I need. I'm now gonna go and I'm gonna obtain project funding, okay? Now that project funding could be uh, Bridge New York funding, it could be local state dollars only. It could be state money you want to use, like Culbert, New York. You could be using your CHIPS funding for it. This is where you decide which way am I going to go to pay for this project. You know, if it's a small, just some crosswalks, you're probably just going to use local dollars. But at some point, you're like, you know, really, 
it becomes more complicated. I need some help. I don't have the ca cash resources to cover more than the monthly payments. Maybe I can get some help there or get reimbursed. So this is where we're going to decide, do we go get federal aid funding? Okay, there is quite a bit of federal aid out there. The bill is coming, so there'll be some things there, but just what's out there now, there's the Surface Transportation Program, there's a Highway Safety Improvement Program, HSIP, there's the Transportation Alternatives Program, TAP, there's CMAC, Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality, which is more for an urban area, but there's money out there for looking at different things you want to improve. If you want to improve routes to school, that money is now part of TAP, okay? There are TIGER grants. This is for economic recovery. That's where the E and the R come from. So transportation investment generating economic recovery. One of the things I would say is develop your program, your projects, excuse me, first. Figure out what you think you'd like to do, then go out and see what might be eligible. And by the way, if you get to know your regional local projects liaison, RL, PL, they can actually help you figure out what might be possible. If you're an MPO, talk to them, they can help you. If you're not sure and you're not an MPO, go talk to the Regional Planning Development Board or the Tug Hill Commission. Talk to your neighbors to see what's eligible. And yes, there may be some additional things coming out. And yes, the new program is, there's a new program I mentioned earlier called RAISE which is taking over for Tiger, uh, there's always gonna be something new. That's why there's those three dots uh, down there because just when you think you know a program, it might be changed. You know, we still hear people talk about safe routes to school and it hasn't been a separate program in quite a while. So keep that in mind. Thanks for that note. So I'm gonna show you a list of five projects. Now, this is real simplistic and I don't have all the details. I just want you to think about this for a second. Which would be federally eligible? Bridge replacement on a local road, new sidewalk to a school, rehab of a low volume road, safety improvements at an intersection, signal replacement at the mall. Which one would be federally eligible? Let's see how we do. Supposedly, according to this, you can select more than one though. I don't trust poll everywhere on this particular one because it's giving me full percentages. It's supposed to give me how many people, but I got people in the Q and A putting A, A, D, and E, A, B, C, and D. All of them, okay. There's two questions you have to ask when it comes to federally eligible and whether you're gonna go get federal funds. The one is, is it even eligible for funding? Bridge replacements almost assuredly are gonna be eligible. All bridges 20 feet and longer in span are eligible for federal aid. A sidewalk to a school is likely a safety improvement. That is always going to be eligible for federal aid. So a safety improvement in an intersection would be eligible for federal aid. Rehab of a low volume road, boy, that'd be tough there's just probably not gonna be that many projects where you would meet the requirements. Generally, when it comes to rehabs and reconstructions, the federal aid is gonna be aimed at the arterial and the national highway system, okay? So a low volume road is not likely on the national highway system. And a signal replacement at the mall, most of the time is probably gonna to have to be covered by the mall, um, but it might have a part of a safety improvement. There's some possibilities. But here's the second question you need to ask yourself. Even if it is eligible, is it competitive and is it worth it? Now, if it's a small project, it might not be worth it. And yes, a bridge replacement on a local road is eligible. But remember, you're competing against 10,000 other bridges that are out there, some of which are huge spans and more importantly, carry thousands and thousands of vehicles a day. So when it goes into the pool, there may not be funds available just because of competition, because there's a limited resource even at the federal level. So keep that in mind. And this is just a quick list. We'll talk a little bit more about what's federally eligible, but keep that in mind. If it's eligible, it may not be competitive. And this is where you're deciding if I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna seek funding. 
Okay. So before you go seek the funding, try to become familiar with the sources and the rules. Make sure you think you can comply with any budgets and schedules that you've got. The timing is really key. So as you're developing your project scope, okay, make sure you've got a realistic timing and budget. Okay. And again, when you ask for the funds, ask for all the funds that you think you might need. That can include design funds, by the way. That's, that's eligible. If it's the project is eligible, the design is eligible to be spend federal dollars, but you have to be pre-approved. Okay. And of course, there's always competition when you're seeking funding. And someone in the QA point, you're competing within the MPO. Yeah, that's true. You're competing with other people in your MPO for dollars. If you're outside an MPO, you're still competing with others for those dollars. There's always a bit of a competition when it comes to aid in this particular case, unlike say CHIPS funds where the money is just allocated by municipality. There's good arguments that can be made that we actually need both kinds of funding, um, but that's a discussion for a different day. So back to the roles and responsibilities, just as a reminder, at the federal level, they're gonna be reviewing and approving any proposals or anything that's gonna be put onto the state transportation improvement program, okay? They're gonna make sure that the regulations and the standards are being provided as these projects start to come in, okay? And they're gonna make sure before the projects are approved that they're eligible and they're gonna reimburse for the eligible expenses, okay? The states and the locals, this is where you're gonna be conceiving your plans, you're gonna initiate your projects, and then, of course, after the federal aid is done, you're the one maintaining and operating the highway. So the other thing I always try to tell people when you're developing a plan to go get federal aid, if you're going to go get federal aid, make sure you get the best project you can get and think about the maintenance cost. Because if you put a project in that has a huge maintenance cost, that's your own dollars. You're going to have to maintain it with your own dollars. If, on the other hand, you design it so that it's last a little longer with just preventive maintenance, maybe that's a better design, but you got to do that up front, okay? Uh, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A, which is good. Can funding for utility work come from federal aid on safety or a bridge project that would include replacement in kind of utilities? Yes, but it, you have to be careful about what's eligible and why you're adding it to it, okay? So that's actually one, I want to come back to, so I'm going to have Amanda throw that one into uh, the Q&A later on. The answer is yes, with a caveat. You need to be aware of limitations on the particular funding source. There has to be a reason you're replacing those using the federal dollars, okay? Sometimes it is, most of the times it is, but sometimes it might not be, so you need to ask up front. If your estimated project cost is lower, does it make it more likely to be awarded the funding? Or is it better to estimate high to make sure that all the scope is covered? That's something people like to do. They tend to either want to go low, well, I can get the money, or they go high because then they're like, well, that way I know I've got plenty of funds. Reality is you really probably need to be close with just a little bit of wiggle room. Don't go too high because you do get less competitive then. And if your estimate is out of sorts, that can get a lower score when it's ranked. You know, if you think the bridge rehab is going to be 250,000 and they're looking at it and you put in half a million, <laughs> um, you could be in trouble because they're going to go, this isn't a well-written grant. So you really want realistic numbers in there. Okay. But just make sure you put everything. Don't shortchange yourself. And yes, somebody put in there, safety at a railroad crossing could come under the federal uh, transit administration or you know, the railroad people, the railroad group, FRA, um, or it could be FHWA, depends. They may actually be both. You know, federal dollars don't just stop at federal highway, though they're our primary source. There are lots of other federal dollars out there. Okay, so we've gotten our federal dollars. We're now gonna execute a project agreement. And again, I'm gonna remind you of this again and again. The reason that the folks at the local programs bureau did, the projects bureau did this, our programs bureau, that got my programs and projects right, is you want to make sure you've got agreements before you move on to the next step. If you don't have an agreement, you may not get reimbursed. So you need to execute a project agreement with, in this case, locals with the state. Okay. Now, that project agreement may involve 
people from the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization. It may involve putting it on your local transportation improvement program and then on the state. There is probably going to be a public meeting involved in this case. So for our bridge, are we looking at, you know, what are we going to actually be doing on our bridge rehab or replacement? On our safety improvement in our neighborhood, what are the steps involved? We're going to have an agreement on what's going to be done. And so you're going to have a federal aid local project agreement, which you'll see a lot of times written as SLA. So in the Q&A, can somebody tell me why and what does SLA stand for if it's a federal aid local project agreement? What does SLA stand for? Very good, state local agreement. The name tells you who's involved. Yeah, good job. It's the state with the local agencies, okay? So it's for federal aid, but it's, you'll see SLA written down. It's the state local agreement. It's gonna have different parts to it. It's gonna have a schedule which talks about the project phases, the funding, uh, if there's any deposits of funds that have to be placed ahead of time for financial reasons, okay? It's gonna have issues in, such as the distribution of who's responsible for different roles within the project, who from the local is the project manager, things like that, okay? It has to include obligating the funding. Remember, it's a reimbursement program. So this is where that local board has to have taken a positive act to say, yes, we're obligating the funding. It has to be included in the municipal budget, okay? Now, could it be in the general fund? Could it be in the D accounts for those in the counties and counties? Could it be a special project account within the local jurisdiction? The answer on all three is yes. I prefer myself, if it's going to be a federal project, I would do a separate fund to keep those dollars separate. But that's something you have to decide between you and your board and the uh, people doing the comptroller or the treasury kind of work. This is where you're designating that local responsible official. Who's going to sign off on things? And again, most of the time, that's going to be an elected person. Or the board can take a positive act and assign someone that duty. But the board does have to take action to make that happen. So the process, now you think the process is a big circle, okay? But here's what actually happens. The sponsor develops all the paperwork with help from the RLPL and they send it over to the regional office in New York State DOT, okay? Now New York State DOT takes that and they send up to Albany, up to main office and the federal highway, okay? Primarily federal highway looks it over to make sure that it's compliant it's going to be efficient, it's going to be effective, and they send it back to the regions. That's where those area engineers get involved. Then the regional people send that thing that Federal Highway has reviewed to main office. Okay, Main office then sends it up to the Attorney General's office, AG, and the comptroller, who approves everything, and then it gets sent back to the sponsor as an executed agreement. Okay, So it's, a, it's not quite a circle, it's more of a Circle with a little bit of a detour. And remember, as they say in Monty Python, the Holy Grail, it's only a model. There's always going to be times when, okay, maybe main office needs to be pulled in, or maybe we have to actually circumvent and go back to the sponsor at some point. This is the theoretical steps that are involved. But the key here is it's going to take some time. So it's not something you're going to execute in a week. It's going to take longer than you might think. So be patient. Okay, you should probably be looking at projects you're starting the next federal physical year, which is in October, or even into 2023, and big projects even longer than that. And remember, no authorization, no reimbursement. So this SLA, this state local agreement, is key. It's a formal agreement between the state and the locals that obligates the federal government to reimburse eligible cost. Okay, in New York State annually. Now, I don't know how old these numbers are, but the number I got from NYSDOT was $1.7 billion of local federal aid from New York State DOT, okay? That's a lot, quite a bit of money to manage, okay? Uh, so that's why there has to be a process in place because that's a lot of funds. Now we're talking some real zeros here, okay? 
Now we're going to start scoping. Now, again, a lot of this you might do before you get the federal aid. So this process you can use at any time. It's actually a pretty cool process. It's described in chapters 6, 7, 8, and 11 of the LPM and in something called the Project Development Manual that the state has for their own projects. There's some good information in there on scoping. And again, it looks like one step in the big wheel, but it's really maybe the single most important step after getting the funding. So think about what is the scope? What are you doing on your bridge? What are you doing for your safety exercise? The biggest thing I would worry about here, this is a big problem on a lot of projects. By the way, all of our projects do this, not just federal aid, in something called scope creep, where, oh, let's add this feature, let's add that feature. And all of a sudden, what was a $250,000 bridge rehab becomes a $2 million bridge rehab with aesthetic treatment, or uh, just an intersection improvement becomes a roundabout and goes well outside the budget that you've got available, okay? This is where you're gonna be thinking about, do you actually need to look at the whole corridor, okay? Do you need to have public meetings? Some cases you need to, in other cases, it's a good idea. Maybe do a local meeting at the local fire hall to finalize the scope, okay? This is where you're gonna be obtaining your design consultant if you're not doing it in-house, okay? If you're doing in-house, you do need an engineer, by the way, so it has to be stampable. But this is where you're doing all the scoping activities. It is okay now. If you get down this and you realize, you know, we really need to replace the bridge or we really need to do that roundabout for the intersection. It's okay to say to Federal Highway and to the state, you know, we aren't gonna be able to do this project. Do it now. Don't do it halfway down the road. Do it now, it's okay. You're not gonna get yourself, oh my. Turn the money back before you spend it. Don't get into the middle of it and find out you've just gotten yourself up to your tail and now you're surrounded by alligators, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna do a project exercise, okay? I wanna walk through an entire project with you. We're gonna do two of these exercises. The first one is gonna be a simple one. The second one's gonna be a little more complicated, you'll see. We're going to do planning, we're going to do scoping, design, construction, and we're even going to think a little bit about the operations and maintenance, okay? And yes, you could scope before the SLA. This is why we're going to do this process now, okay? Because you may not be able to ask for more money later on. That's why it's so important to get this right. Again, maybe even before you do the state-local agreement, okay? So our first project we're going to do together is an ice cream sundae. Okay, so I want you to think about, you'd like to tonight when you get home, have an ice cream sundae. The weather's turning good, it's getting sunny. We're gonna have an ice cream sundae. So what I want you to think about is all the steps, all the steps, all the components, everything you need for an ice cream sundae. And let's throw that in the poll everywhere. Okay. Let's see what you come up with for our ice cream sundae exercise. You need your cone, if you're putting it on a cone, you need a dish to put it in. You need your ingredients, which is ice cream and maybe some whipped cream, yeah, okay. You need toppings, okay. You gotta go buy them, gotta make sure they're in the freezer and, or the fridge. Maybe you gotta have it gluten-free, maybe somebody gluten-free, okay. Ooh, somebody over in the Q&A put, you gotta have a bowl, yeah, okay. Let's see, do I see it yet? Somebody said a spoon. Did someone forget a spoon when we did this exercise once? Cherry napkins, ooh, that's a good idea. Napkins, okay, yep. Okay, think of all the things. You gotta have nuts. What's the procedure? What size are you putting it into it? What are the tools and equipment? Okay. And someone here says slather the whipped cream on. That's pretty good, yeah, I like that, okay. You gotta worry about lactose issues. My wife has to worry about lactose issues, yeah. Bananas, ooh, I like that. Some pretty good stuff. Somebody's developing a sales plan to sell their ice cream sundaes, yeah. By the way, oh, there we go, I see it. Somebody put in dishwasher. Because again, you got at the end of this, you're gonna have to clean everything up and get it ready for the next ice cream sundae, okay? Now that sounds like a simple process. We do that every night for dinner. 
My mom always said that was the worst part about making dinner was thinking about what we were gonna do. But you're doing a scoping exercise and you're walking through the entire project, okay? So now we've got two choices. We could either do our bridge project, our bridge we had, or we can do our uh, project with the safety of an improvement of an intersection. So I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. So everybody who would like to do a bridge scoping exercise, raise your hand. Everybody wanna do a bridge exercise. We're gonna use the democratic system, which means votes, okay? Once it slows down, we're gonna stop. Okay, we got 56. Okay, now, Amanda, clear that for me, please. Now, I'm gonna clear, there we go. Now, everybody who wants to do a safety project, do a safety project. How many did we get there? Okay. 37, so bridge wins. Okay, so now everybody, we can do our bridge exercise. Okay, so what are we gonna have for our bridge? And I'm gonna clear this one more time because there's still some responses that came in from before. And I know some people have started putting bridge things in, but now for our bridge, we're doing a rehab of uh, say an arch bridge. What do we need to have in terms of inside of our scope? Okay. Utilities, absolutely. Hydraulics have to be checked. We might need to have permits. We need to check the location of everything. Are there limits? What's the right of way? Very good, okay. Do you have any as-built plans from the existing structure? Okay. What's the soil structure? Is there a foundation issue? Okay. Some people putting into the Q&A, things like inspection for design, an environmental report. Do you need borings? Okay. What's the loading going to be afterwards? Is there any hazardous material in the area? Are there any sewers, both storm and sanitary? What about the neighbors? Okay. Traffic, volume, but also, do I see, I don't see detour on there. If you're going to close it, do you have a detour? Do you need to? Could you do half at a time? Okay. Bats, somebody put bats, environmental issues that you got to think about. Okay. What's the access for the stream? What's the access work zone traffic control? Is it historical? Okay, um, especially old bridges could be historical. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Nobody put on here um, agreements with the state for federal aid. How are you gonna pay for it? That's part of the scoping process. Is there a crash accident history? Maybe it needs safety included in the bridge. That happens actually more often than you think. This is the time to think about it, okay? So this is where you put your whole scope. Spend the time on this, take your time, get yourself a big chalkboard, a big whiteboard, those super-sized post-it notes, and just go to town. Let people write down anything they've got, think it all through. This is a bit, great time to brainstorm, okay? In fact, a good technique actually is to let people do it on their own first, and then have everybody come in and let them go around at least one answer at a time to go through the whole scope. You don't want to miss something. But think about, do you need inspectors? Think about, did you think about closure? What's the maintenance plan later on? I see maintenance is up there. It's got quite a few votes. That's really important because again, if you set it up right, maybe you've got less cost for maintenance later on. Don't do something you're going to want it with a burden. And of course, you want to think about cost you're gonna cost all of this out, absolutely, okay? So scoping is a really key important point here and something we need to think about, okay? So now we're going to hire our consultant, okay? Now, somebody in the Q&A before we talk about step four, hiring that consultant is talking about New York City, you have to follow agency requirements. Well, yeah, local agencies can have their own standards and their own requirements on top of state and federal requirements. That's true. And the larger the agency, the more likely you're gonna have your own process. A lot of cities have their own processes. Certainly a lot of counties will have that. And we know New York City may have that too. These are in addition to everything else. So you need to know those processes. 
which is another reason it's good to have a full-time person running the project. So now we're gonna be hiring and selecting the consultant, okay? Now, some of the Q&A questions that came in earlier, we put aside because I knew we were gonna be talking about them here in just a couple of minutes. Remember, these are for if they are federally funded. So let's keep this in mind. What I'm talking about is when they're federally funded, here's the requirements that you've got to go through. So you've got some options. Consultant really means the person who's stamping it, the engineer, or in some cases, actually an architect. I mean, there are some projects like parks projects where it's actually an architect, the landscape architect who would actually be doing the stamping. Okay. Oh, great question. Okay. Now I'm gonna give you a quick answer on this Q&A before we move on, but I definitely wanna have this one this afternoon. And that is what if local requirements conflict with federal requirements, okay? We will actually come back with a couple of examples later on, but a general rule of thumb is the locals can be more restrictive. They cannot be less restrictive, okay? And the same with the state versus federal dollars. So if the locals have a requirement that you have to have uh, a certain number of inspectors, you can have more, you can't have less. They have to be more restrictive. And we will come back with some examples. And I definitely, Amanda, throw that one in the afternoon pool because that's a really important one I want to hear from both NYSDOT and FHWAF. So here's your options for hiring in your engineer or your architect. We're going to talk about engineer mostly because we're dealing with bridges and safety. But Remember, this is true for anything we have to stamp it. It could be a municipal employee, okay? So if you have an on-staff engineer who can stamp the drawings, great. You can hire a retained consultant, okay? This is somebody who is hired on retainer with the municipality. They work on project by project. They're paid a fixed fee, okay, to work on these various projects. Or you can go out and do QBS process, okay? Acronym time, what's QBS stand for? Let's see what the Q&A said. QBS, what is QBS? Quit bothering somebody? I don't know, it's QBS, let me see what this. Qualification-based selection or quality-based selection. Qualification is the more technical one, but yeah, okay. Essentially, you have to have a process to select the consultant, okay? That's pretty important. By the way, when you hire a retained engineer, you actually should be using the same process. And you may have to document that you retained your consultant using a QBS process, especially if you're getting federal aid. So you really need to be following that, okay? If it's locally funded, you can use your local process. But remember, QBS is technically still required, okay? So you really want to be doing QBS. Now, somebody asked about who's responsible for monitoring if a sponsor is complying with uh, those federal projects that we saw earlier on, those things like ADA and Title VI. Um, there's no monitoring police, as it were, but if something happens and there are mechanisms in place for people to uh, comment on these things, they can come down on you and audit you and take your funds or even go after local dollars. So. Be aware of that. Um, and our federal aid project plan is designed by a municipal employer to require to be stamped by PE. Yeah, you, you got to follow the rules. You got to have a PE doing the work. That's New York State education law, actually. It gets you there. Okay, so you do need a PE to stamp. And federal dollars, you're going to need that because you're going to be over $5,000. Anything over $5,000, you really need to have a PE involved. And with federal dollars, you need to have somebody who can stamp. Okay. Now, that process can have to up to three years. You can have a three-year process. And for QBS, qualifications-based selection, you would place an advertisement out there, okay? And you would uh, evaluate your proposals, usually using a committee. You would interview your top-rated firms. And in the beginning, you tell people how many firms you're going to interview. Two, three. Three, by the way, is usually the preferred minimum and back may be required. Okay, you're gonna then re-rank after the interviews and make a final selection. Up front, you need to tell people how you're going to rank them on technical qualifications, on how many different staff people they've got, things like that, okay? 
there's something called the Brooks Act. The Brooks Act says that when you make your final selection, you can use all kinds of factors, but for engineering, cost is not a factor, okay? So you really need to have a good scope for those people. Otherwise you might have cost issues. So cost is technically not a factor, okay? So keep that in mind, okay? So does somebody ask, does this Trump state and local capital procurement rules? Well, if you're getting federal dollars, yeah, <laughs> because you've got to show you follow the QBS process for getting federal dollars. And technically you should be using QBS if you're doing local as well. But uh, yeah, again, it's this case of what's more restrictive. You can't be less restrictive. So you have to have at least QBS. You could have more qualifications, but cost cannot be a factor in the choosing of a professional in this case. Okay. Now, I'm gonna bring up something called the LDSA, okay? The Local Design Service Agreement. You may have seen that, you may have heard about it. That is actually done through the New York State County Highway Superintendents Association. Their website is www.countyhighways.org. It's a process that was developed for helping people select that consultant. It meets all of the standards and the qualifications. It's pretty cool, okay? What you do is you go, you list your project criterion, and there's a selection committee that did ratings. And all you have to do is find the LDSA list for your region and contact all of the firms on that list with your list of project criteria, okay? It's actually a really nice process. The county folks have already done a lot of the work so you only have to choose from a limited list of pre-qualified consultants. And you're probably wondering, why am I showing you a pie? Well, it turns out that on Pi Day, that was Monday, 314, the results for 2022 to 2025, three years, was released. So there's now a brand new list available of consultants. You don't have to go invent the wheel. You don't have to do the process. You can actually use the LDSA process to select your consultant. You're still going to need to have that criterion. You still need to going to contact them and you still have to do part two of the process. That's the negotiation part. But what you do is you prepare the list and you send it to those engineering firms. And then here's where we can start looking at some estimates and cost issues. But normally, you're going to get independent estimates. You're going to negotiate the task. That's the more critical things. You're going to apply the cost and you're going to negotiate with the firm for what you're going to be doing. Okay. This is where you figure out the final who you're going to select from. You're going to negotiate. You're going to audit them if need be. That can be done. Locals can audit. That's fine. It might be state or federal that can audit too, by the way. Once you've done this and you've picked your firm and you're happy and you think the cost is what you can cover, well, guess what? You execute an agreement with the firm that you're gonna have involved as your consultant on your federal aid project. You'll send that to the state. The RLPL will be the person you get that. They get a fully executed agreement, which is usually signed by the responsible local official, okay? So I got a question about that. I'm hiring an engineering firm. We're gonna come back to this. DBE stands for Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, okay? This is where we're talking about small firms that you know, have disadvantages, whether that's due to minorities or women. Um, is DBE participation required for consultants? Is DBE required for consultants? Yeah, y'all are pretty good. Now the answer is yes. You still have to meet the requirement for DBE for consultants, okay? Depending on the federal aid process, um, it could be up to 20%. And there is discussion going on right now where there may be a change in the DBE program. So there will no longer be a standard goal. So the amount might not be the 20% that you may have seen in some literature, okay? But yes, you have to follow DB requirements, um, but it may be changing in the future. But for now, 
Keep in mind that 20% is a number that you're going to see. Again, we're looking at today, but also into the future. So the amount might change, but you still need to follow whatever the DBA procedure is currently out. Okay. Now, I've got my agreement. I've got my executed agreement with my consultant. I'm now going to go to my design phase. Okay. And remember, because it's an authorization and reimbursement program, this is where we're getting our authorization to proceed to preliminary design and right of way incidental phases. Okay. This is LPM chapters 7, 8, 11. Okay. And there's some stuff in this uh, project development manual from the state, which is actually pretty good to look at. If I would pick a document to get other than the LPM in my library that I'd review is the PDM. There are some conflicts, I will tell you now. The project development manual from New York State DOT is written with DOT in mind. And so there are places where the local uh, agencies don't have access or there's some differences. Just be aware that might happen, but there's some pretty good information in there. So that's a pretty good one to download and look at it. So let's talk about design. Now design has a lot of steps in it and it looks like, oh my goodness, we could be here forever. But notice, design approval, authorization, proceed with preliminary design. A lot of these steps are really just stopping points, checkpoints to make sure we follow through the steps before we move on to the next step. So they don't actually, they're not as many steps as you think in terms of time just steps in terms of making sure we've done our check marks, okay? And what is the time limitation of use of federal funding sources, someone asked? That's one we're gonna have to come back to. It does vary. It depends on the project. It's usually part of the agreement, the SLA. I'll tell you that, <clears throat> but it's usually also in the obligation of the funding. There's a time limit, yes. We'll come back to that one when we get the Q&A this afternoon. So preliminary design phases, there are technically four of them, okay? It's really, again, the same concept. Do something, check it. Do another something, check it. So we don't get in a situation where we miss something early on that we needed to catch, like right-of-way issues or environmental issues. This is where that project scope is really important to make sure that what's eligible, what isn't eligible, okay? This is where you're making technical decisions on our bridge project. You know, if we were doing a replacement, are we going with concrete or steel? Um, if we're doing a safety improvement, are we choosing between uh, one type of traffic light or another? Are we putting in raised crosswalks or a whole raised intersection? That's the kind of things we'd be possibly doing here. Some technical decisions, okay? This is where we're doing our environmental reviews and our coordination with almost everybody. This is where you need to sort of actually make a laundry list of who do you have to coordinate with, okay? So just think about all the agencies that you might have to coordinate with. It could be a pretty long list, okay? So, you know, who would have to be included when you do that, okay? So let me just ask you that. I'm gonna mention public involvement, by the way. We'll come back to public involvement in a minute, but let me ask, who will you need to coordinate with? Who do you need to coordinate with? You might do right of way, the Department of Environmental Conservation or DEC. Um, if you're in the New York City watershed, the Department of Environmental Protection, the Army Corps of Engineers, okay? You may have EPA involvement in some cases, especially if you've got uh, you know, certain species that are under protection, okay? You certainly wanna contact your community, um, local companies and businesses, and you can make a laundry list. Some of these will be regulatory agency. Some of these are going to just be people we need to coordinate to make the project successful, okay? Again, same concept. Take yourself a whiteboard or a big post-it note and just write down agencies. Definitely the regulatory agencies. It's definitely the local municipalities, okay? Um, people using it, you might even want to start talking to your local contractors. That's certainly something being done with the 81 corridor work that's going to be done, letting them know projects might be coming down the pike. You might need to talk to SHPO, State Historic Preservation Office. Um, 
They also do parks, okay? There are some rules, by the way, when you get into parks, we're gonna come back to in a little bit, okay? So yeah, something to think about. Now going back to my last slide just briefly, this is also where you take that estimate of the schedule and the cost and you can tweak it one last time, okay? So you can tweak things, maybe get some public involvement. If after you've done this, you realize you just don't have the funding, you can try going back and asking for funds. This is where you can make that decision before you spend a lot of money um, to pull back. So it's another possible place to pull back. Now, let me just see here in our Q&A, what other questions do we have before we move on to uh, who's involved in public involvement? Uh, we've actually done that pretty well, but we'll come back to it in a second. Um, does the PDM or LPM help guide which environmental and other reviews might be needed? Absolutely. There are checklists in these documents that help you figure out what agencies need to be involved. That's one of the reasons I actually would download them. Yes, they're thick. Yes, they have a lot of paper. You can do it electronically. Um, but yeah, they have checklists. And again, pick up the phone and talk to your RLPL. They can help you out. And again, do a similar kind of exercise. Now, in terms of who's involved in public involvement, we're not talking about regulatory things. What I want you to think of is what's the one word you would want to have involved in your public involvement. There are some requirements for public involvement in transportation. There's a link to that in your stuff. But really it comes down to making sure you don't miss any of the, as you've got in there, stakeholders. It could be businesses. It could be, let's see, do I see it on there? Ah, I don't see schools. Schools need to be in there if you think about it, okay? The elected boards, legislatures needs to be in there, okay? Who's going to be affected by the project? If it's a bridge project, it could be a detour for a while, or it could now, maybe you would like to put up aesthetic treatment, okay? Think about who might need to be involved. Landowners, parks, yeah. Again, really important to think about your public involvement, okay? Cool. Nice job. Now we're going to switch gears and have a little bit of fun. Right of way. <laughs> right of way creates all kinds of fun things in New York State, especially when you get into the town, county, and village systems, okay, because of some rules that we have and laws that we've got. But realize that the right of way incidentals, as they're called, have to be included in the design report, okay? And right-of-way is something you cannot assume. You have to have documentation on what is the right-of-way before you can proceed to any kind of construction activity, okay? There's something called the Federal Uniform Act. There's also a Federal Highway Administration right-of-way and real estate uh, regulation that's out there. And there's the New York State Eminent Domain Procedure Law. All of these come into play, and there are actually some other laws as well, but these are the primary ones, that includes the fact that you really have to know your right of way, okay? So you have to have title searches to know who owns the land. You may have to prepare something they call a brochure that sort of lists, what do I need for right of way, okay? You're gonna need to prepare some maps and deeds when you're taking land over, and you're gonna to have to do property approaches. And at the end of this process, you're gonna have a list, a table of proposed right-of-way acquisition. If you don't own it, you don't have a right-of-way document, a piece of paper, okay? Preferably the first, but the second can be used in some cases, but you've gotta have public land, okay? To be able to get things through the system. That's important because you don't want to build something and find out later on it's actually private land. Now what happens? Ooh, that's not good. And of course, here in New York State, we have something called roads by use and streets by prescription. Highway law 189 for the town, village law 6-626 for those who really care. But more importantly, this can even apply to county roads that used to be town roads or city or county roads that used to uh, that the county or city is actually maintained inside of a town jurisdiction or village jurisdiction. Um, the case law on this is 30 something pages. The law itself is one paragraph in both cases. The basic rule is you either got to have a piece of paper that have the right of way 
or you have this road by use, which is used by the public and maintained by the municipality for 10 or more years. We could spend a whole day talking about this. We're not going to, but I just want you to keep that in mind. If it's a road by use, you're gonna to have to go out and you're gonna to have to, as a minimum, get permanent easements, but better yet, get the deeds, get the land. So let me ask you this. Where is the edge of the right-of-way? Put your, put your little dot. Where do you think the edge of the right-of-way is? Assume this is a road by use, by the way. Okay. Where would you put the right-of-way? Okay. You can see there's a whole bunch of people putting different marks down. Okay. Somebody put the center line. We do get more than that. Roads by use, you pretty much, your minimum you'll get is the pavement. Okay. Would you get to the behind that tree? Absolutely not. That tree would definitely not be in the right of way because it's a fixed object at this point. You obviously haven't maintained it. You wouldn't get behind the fence because obviously that could be a safety issue. So you're not going to be have behind the fence. So you might get in front of the fence, but if you've never maintained it, you've never mowed it, you've never put up a sign, no. And mowing by itself probably doesn't count. Plowing does not count, okay? You've got to show proactive maintenance to get that width, okay? Um, unless behind the fence is an easement. Well, but again, if you have an easement, you have a piece of paper that says, I have that right. Oh, and by the way, it is possible to have an easement, but there's nothing connecting that easement. That has happened, okay? So get a deed, <laughs> get an easement, okay? Somebody's saying hi, I see that, very good, okay. Um, and yeah, pipes would usually count, things like that. But now let's look at some actual projects. This was sent to me by an RLP out of Binghamton, Dave McEwen, and some pretty cool stuff here. So here we have a sidewalk just at the edge of the right of way, okay? Now the AHB is the apparent highway boundary and I'll draw in the actual sidewalk and you can see it goes right over the top of that AHB line. It was surveyed in. Um, sidewalks are probably not gonna count towards streets by use since the curb is all that's needed. So that sidewalk, if you needed to do any work on it is outside the right of way. So you're gonna to have to extend it, okay? And if you're right at the edge, wow, that is really tough, okay? And by the way, this might be an actual approximate boundary. It might be an actual boundary, depending on how they've laid it out, okay? And roads by use and streets by prescription, it gets very complicated very quick, okay? How about this one? I'll just draw the lines in so you can see what kind of confusion you get. Let me draw another one. This is even more challenging. So here is a sidewalk. Here is another sidewalk. Here is the right, right of way on the north side. Here's the right of way on the south side, the blue line. Most people assume the right of way is centered on the roadway. It doesn't have to be. <laughs> in this case, the roadway, the street, migrated or was put in at the southern edge of the actual right-of-way, okay? So now let's say I'm gonna be working on this, okay? And I'm gonna ask you then, where is the southern edge needed for my right-of-way in this case? Yeah, I gotta at least include that sidewalk and probably a little bit further because during construction, I'm gonna to need to do some work and I might even need to do some maintenance later on. So yeah, somebody's doing a question mark, I see that. But the idea is you might need to be thinking about that. South enough to do work on the sidewalk, okay? Now, this is the kind of thing that's pretty important to think about. And we could, again, we could spend a lot of time on the right of way if we wanted to and we could get ourselves in big trouble if we're not careful. So keep that in mind. And somebody asked how sidewalks are not covered in roads by use and uh, areas that are mowed are. Well, that has to do with the way case law works and the fact that if you're mowing it, you might, and I said might get right of way, you may not. <laughs> um, it has to come down to, is it a highway function or not? 
Sidewalks are not considered a highway function. Curbs are, sidewalks are not. Okay, a couple more quick examples and then we're gonna move on and we are coming up on our uh, break. Okay, we're gonna be taking a lunch break here in just a couple of minutes. Here's a situation where we've got a sidewalk. Okay, the existing street is actually outside the right of way. Not just the sidewalk, but the street itself is outside the right of way. Okay, you've got to resolve this before you get past design. This has to be resolved and you've got to know what that is. You don't want a situation like this. This is the Hess estate. It's a 25 inch triangle in New York City that was never properly taken over. And the person who owned it wanted to thumb their nose at the city. Okay, it's down in Greenwich Village, by the way and it's never been dedicated for public purposes, okay? Um, and so that's something to be thinking about, okay? Now, to finish up our morning discussion, land acquisition, you're gonna need a minimum of a permanent easement. Temporary easements are only good during the construction phase. And yes, you can do them, but they're only gonna be temporary while you're working. If you're ever gonna be back, you need a permanent easement, Better yet, get a deed, purchase the land. Now, a great question in here, and that is, when attaining right-of-way for roads by you, should takings begin at the center line of the road? They don't have to. If you can truly document what has been maintained, okay, you can include that as part of the known right-of-way. But what you need to do is you need to put it in the deed there, and then it has to be signed off by the landowner. Because most people's deeds, in those road by use situations, read to the center line. So what you would have in there is you would be telling them, look, we already have this as a right of way. We need to go beyond this. That's the agreement we have to have. By acknowledging you already got this right of way, they're taking care of that particular problem. So the takings don't have to start the center line, but the documentation needs to mention what is the right of way and it has to be agreed upon by the landowner. Okay. So it could take a while to do this, okay? And yes, I got a misspelling. Very good, Phyllis, nice job. Catching a spelling error, I'll fix that, thank you. Okay, um, so let's see, getting a corporation council to the main area property of the streets, um, is that considered an acquisition? No, no, I don't think it would, but that's a good question. We uh, might wanna, we'll throw that one back out of the DOT and federal highway people at the end. But just an order from a council, that'd have to be something going to courts. And I'm not sure it would pass the Uniform Act, but I'm not positive of that one. I'll, we'll throw that one in the afternoon question pool. Um, okay. And so just as a reminder, we'll take our lunch break. No authorization, don't go forward. And by the way, during this preliminary phase, you're not acquiring property. Everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to go out and buy property. No, no, no. You're documenting what you have and what you don't have. You're not negotiating with a property owner. You're not making commitments on offers. You're not acquiring property. You don't do that until after you've got design approval. Okay? So you wait until the next phase, and we'll be talking about that after lunch when we talk about preparing to design approval document. Okay? We'll come back to eminent domain and some of these other things later on. We are currently at slide 113, but I will put back up because I promised I would. Before we take our break, let you start putting in your questions. We'll be getting some already in the Q&A, okay? And we will be back this time, one hour from now. So that puts us at, Well, I can do that. And let me see if I can get my 12.45 here. That's not too bad. Okay. See everybody at 12.45. And again, if you want to put in your questions, feel free to do so. Enjoy your lunch.
We'll be starting up in about five minutes for those who are uh, finishing up your lunch. Okay, we're about to start back up. Uh, one last chance, if you have any questions that you haven't thrown in the Q&A, uh, that would be for the panel this afternoon, let me know and put them in. Otherwise, we're gonna get started up here in just a second. I do have a few questions that were put in the Q&A that I will be answering in the next hour. So stand by, I haven't uh, forgotten about you. So now we're on to step six preparing the design approval document. This is uh, where that project development manual, the PDM can be very helpful because it does outline pretty well the things that need to be in there. Because again, the state has to prepare these same design approval documents for the FHWA when they are the sponsor. So 
some good information in there. The acronym we use for this is, of course, DAD. Okay, so you know, can remind yourself you've got to do DAD. Always listen to what Dad says, or Father knows best kind of things. And yes, that's me. The little one screaming his head off. So I'm going a little bit since then. But this is the design approval document. Okay, so. Most of you who've done very few projects may not know the answer to this question, but let's see if what people come up with who've got more experience, what should be in the design approval document? Try to do it in one word. We're going to create one of these wordle things. See what, what words? Estimate, yeah. Prices, cost, yeah. Mm -hmm. Scope, permits. Recommendations, any environmental issues? Yeah. Okay. Right of way, proposed issues? Yeah. Permits? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Comprehensive. So, in some respects, this is the beginning of building our PSNE, plan specification and estimates. This is the first major step going towards that. So this, you need a good scope, okay? You need to have good information about features and schedules. Um, you need to have your location, your alternatives, if you have any, you, know, you might have an alternative of steel or concrete you still haven't finalized on, or maybe even gonna go out to bid to allow both choices. You would want that in there. Any environmental and historical stuff is gonna be in here, okay? So very important thing. Some other things that need to be in there. Some of these are acronyms, okay? So you may wanna start learning some of these acronyms like FEAW, I will come back to that in a second. Seeker, State Environmental Quality Review, uh, Endangered Species, Clean Water Act, Fish Habitat, all these things that you, regulations you have to meet, they're in the design approval document that you've reviewed these things and you can move forward, okay? FEAW is the Federal Environmental Approval Worksheet. It's essentially, again, it's a checklist to help us out to go through the process of dealing with the policies under the National Environmental Policy Act. You'll hear the term NEPA used a lot for that. It's a way to go through the process and not have to remember everything. So it's a useful thing to fill out, to find out, do you have to worry about a spotted salamander or some other critter? in your particular area, bats, things like that. So keep that in mind, this is the process we're going through. We're trying to make sure we don't miss something. We want to do it early. We don't want to get caught by something and the whole project gets stopped because we forgot to fill out some form or we forgot a step. And the reason that the feds and the state want to do that is they don't want to just have you start construction and then stop. That's the worst case scenario because now you may even have roads closed and all things being held up. So that's not good. Um, so there is a state version of this, the State Environmental and Quality Review Act that we have to follow through. There is a DC handbook on this particular thing, okay? You as a local are gonna probably be the lead agency, so you're gonna be filling out any kind of assessment forms that have to be filled out, okay? And if, by the way, if you want some good hikes, there's some good stuff on DC's website on hikes, or you can go to all kinds of trail things. The weather's good and good. We can get out there and get some walking done. Um, some of the things just to remind you of, there's Endangered Species Act, specifically Section 7 deals with certain uh, specific processes for compliance and consultation, dealing with certain species such as bats and turtles and uh, sturgeon and some things like that. The main thing there is talk to people, learn, listen. You know, if you're in a tidal area, you're probably going to be dealing with things like turtles and maybe some of the fish. There's bats almost everywhere, okay? Um, just keep in mind that you're trying to not adversely affect these things. And if you're wondering about the website for all these things, they're linked in the handout. There should be a link to the uh, state environmental equality uh, checklist that are in the handout for you. There's another thing called a special fish habitat. Certain fish, they have to be careful. We don't want to overfish them and we don't want to do construction activities that would cause them issues. Now, 
to be honest, some of them are not going to be a major issue for those of us upstate, but maybe in New York City, Long Island, yeah, it could be a big issue depending on the kind of fish. There's a website, again, linked. You can just look at the maps and see if you're going to be near the area. This is all done as part of the design approval document. Okay. So again, there's people helping you out. The biggest thing with most of the fish stuff, by the way, is you can't work in certain times of the year. So for instance, with flounder, you can't work from January 15th to May 31st, no matter what you do. There's some trout restrictions we know from the DEC side, same concepts. By the way, we probably don't wanna be working in certain work anyway when it's cold, so what the heck. Clean Water Act, uh, this just deals with wetlands and equivalent kind of things where we wanna protect existing environmental areas. If it's less than half an acre, if it's a small bridge project, you're doing an intersection and there's obviously no wetlands, is a streamlined procedure. The main thing there is if you have something that you're gonna be near a possible wetland, you're gonna be willing to admit, I'm gonna commit, our agency is gonna do what we can to protect and avoid anything that could damage that wetland to the best of your ability. There is some Army Corps requirements on top of this. And whether you like it or not, we do have a process in New York State that goes through general permits and specific permits. You may not believe it. I think New York actually has a better process than a lot of other states. When I've talked with our colleagues at other LTAP centers in other states, you have to know all of the agencies involved. There's not a nice, clear delineation. Send in one permit, and it walks through the process. You do take longer to do that, but that's the trade-off. I'd rather have a little more time needed and know that I've covered everything, then find out later on I missed something. So I think that's a good thing myself, okay? Um, the Historic Preservation Act, essentially, are there historic properties? Can you answer the question, yes, does the project have potential to cause effect on historic properties? Easy thing to do. The main thing is, is it historic? And that's uh, done through a New York State cultural resource information system or through SHPO, the State Historical and Preservation Office. Um, they can help you out there. If you're not sure, again, pick up the phone, talk to somebody, ask. There is an act which, again, it's one of these things we don't think about too much. Um, it's an old act from 1966 when I was that screaming little baby. Okay, that's when it was passed. That's how old I am. Um, it deals with the fact that if we are working in parks, recreation area, near historic resources, we have to be careful. Okay, what essentially it says is when you're working in those areas, there is a process that you have to think about. And the key is you can identify the use of that property and FHWA is going to get involved to determine if there is something that is just temporary Okay, if it's temporary or de minimis, almost no impact, we can move on. But if you're gonna do something major in terms of a change, there's a process you're gonna to have to do. You're gonna to have to do an evaluation and you're gonna to have to come up with an agreement to make sure that you're not damaging a park in an environmental area or a historic area. And that has to be done in advance, okay? There has to be public involvement, okay? This includes historic bridges, by the way. So that's probably one of the things that you wanna be aware of. If you've got a really old bridge which has historical value, this may happen. I've had this happen with the county. You gotta be careful about that. There may be some involvement if you're near a historical site. Um, it does affect you if you're in a bikeway or a walkway project too. So just be aware of that. This is an act that's been around a long time. The main thing is you got to get federal highways going to get involved and there's going to be a public opportunity to commit a uh, comment. Sorry, not commit, comment on it. Okay. You're probably going to be okay if you can show the transportation project has a net benefit and you have minor involvement with these properties. But again, pick up the phone, talk to somebody and say something. And this reminds me of something, public meetings. There are some required formal meetings that are required, okay, that you've got to have for public information. I'm a huge fan of having informal meetings, not necessarily exactly on the same schedule, to cover uh, different things. So keep that in mind. Sometimes you can get some really good information from people by having a uh, 
public information meeting, getting their ideas in a non-formal setting. But remember, there may be some formal meetings that are required. In those cases, you definitely want to be taking notes and doing all the things you have to follow. This is, again, one of those stop signs. You submit that design approval document, OK? The state is going to approve it before you can do the final design, the final PS&E, OK? So you have to do that. Once you have that document done, you'll submit it. The state will look it over, and they will approve it. And then you're going to have that authorization to proceed to the detailed design step and you can do your final design phases. And this is where you're gonna be pulling in now, you've been pulling in the project design manual. You're also gonna make sure you look at the highway design manual, which is the New York State overall design process for geometrics, thickness, all kinds of stuff. The plan specification and estimates have to include those standards. Now, yes, the engineers have probably already looked at that, but if you haven't looked at it before, you got to pull it in at this particular point, okay? And so there's a whole procedure, engineering design, this whole document is available, the HDM, as it's usually referred to, the Highway Design Manual, okay? This is the state, and you have to follow that unless you have pre-approval. <laughs> Most of the time, you're not going to get it. Just follow the HDM unless there's some really odd stuff. And you'll probably have talked that over with the RLPL long before you get to this phase. This is, by the way, where you're gonna start obtaining your permits, okay? So this is where you're gonna be submitting your permits for environmental issues. You're gonna be submitting your permits through the Army Corps or in New York State, the single permitting system. This is where you're doing that kind of work. Now you're gonna to go to step eight. Now. This is where you acquire property. Remember I told you earlier, you don't acquire property yet. Step eight is where you actually now do that. And this is in the local projects manual, chapter 11. And by the way, a lot of you probably remember the name PLAFAP, P-L-A-F-A-P. That was the old name of the local projects manual. It doesn't really roll off the tongue that well. If you see LPM, it's the newer version of that, okay? So it's local projects manual. And as uh, uh, Dave McEwen put into the Q&A, if you haven't seen it, essentially it covers not only federal aid, but even state aid like CHIPS and uh, Culvert New York and things like that. You would actually follow the procedures in there, though there's some limitations when you're doing only state aid that you don't have to worry about. But yeah, that's, that's the old name of it, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, we're moving on. We're going to be required getting our right of way. During the right of way acquisition phase, there's a couple of things to remind you. First off, you're going to notify the affected property owners. This is where you're going to be starting to do your negotiations, your offerings. You're going to do a written offer of just compensation. You can't just pay people what they want. There's a process in place to pay them, and that means that land has to have been appraised, okay? And there's a procedure for doing that. You're going to be doing title searches. You're going to be doing some kinds of negotiations, but you can only pay them essentially the fair market value. You can't just pay them what they'd like to have. And there's a process involved with that. And you're going to do payments. And those written offers are not somebody saying, help, go ahead, do what you need to do. No, there has to be a map. There has to be essentially it's the same as if you were purchasing it, deeding it. Okay, even if it's just an easement, it's the same process. It's just a little different in terms of the paperwork, but essentially the same kind of surveyed, laid out, actual agreement with the property owner. Okay. And then at the end of the process, you're going to have acquisition of title or rights, written records to the property. Okay. And a good way to think about this. And this is something that uh, Dave McEwen had mentioned when we did our preview, and I think it's a good way to think about it. We should never have a situation where there is a public facility on private property without something documenting that it's there's an easement there. Okay, you got to have something in writing, and that's the challenge of the road by use. It was put in because there was a lot of this going on. How did we deal with this statewide? But now it leads to some other issues. When you're dealing with federal aid, you got to go beyond 
by use, you got to put it in writing. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind. When you think you're done, okay, and you think you've got all the land you need and you have all the right of way easements that you need, you're then going to get your clearance certificate. Okay. This is required from the DOT if it's in the uh, DOT right of way, required from the sponsor. In other words, you got to fill this out before you can move forward and get construction authorization. In other words, before you even go out to advertising, before you can do bids, you need to have permission that you've done all your right of way, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, some people like to say the eminent domain is just a way to club people and get property. Has it been used that way? Yes, I'm, I'm gonna say that it has been. That's not its purpose. Eminent domain is really there to give people public good in places where there's contention. So everybody gets just compensation. It's not easy. Everybody, oh, it's easy. No, it's not easy for either side. It actually is one of the last things we want to do. We'd much rather have an agreement. Everybody's on board doing it properly, okay? So try to do that if you can. That really does help out, okay? Now we're going to be preparing our contract documents, okay? So we're moving forward. And we're going to be preparing our contract documents. This is where we're doing that PSE stuff, okay? Plan specification and estimates. Again, LPM chapters 9, 12, and 15. But more importantly, what do you think has to be in the bid document? So I'm actually going to go out and I'm going to advertise. What has to be included in the overall package of stuff? It's not being the ad, but what is in the bid documents yourself? Quantities, absolutely. What else? Items, what are we paying for? Yeah, okay. A, some kind of bid form, especially if you're going to use some kind of alternative pricing structure. Yeah, and plans, okay. Specifications, and I'm waiting for estimates. Oh, it's an estimate. I thought we did it in perfect order. Yeah, estimates, okay. Any special provisions? You know, your right of way clearance certificate, any permits? need to be included in the package so that the contractor knows, hey, they already have their permits. I don't have to wait, okay? This includes right-of-way agreements. This includes utility rail agreements, any work permit that you might need from the state, okay? Army Corps, okay? The design approval document gets added to this pile of stuff, okay? There has to be a licensed professional who is responsible for the design, the stamper of the project, okay? And if you're on the national highway system or the state system, you're probably gonna have some additional things. Definitely talk to your RLPL about that, okay? You're gonna have your right of way, things like that. Okay, good, good job, nice job, okay. And by the way, there is a list to help you out that you don't have to remember all of this. You know, final plans, specification and estimates, your construction management plan is a pretty important one to have. Okay. So that's a pretty important one to do. Okay. So we'll talk about that here in just a minute. That's the certificate we talked about with right of way, permits, agreements. Oops, went too far. Okay. So that's sort of what you need to have. Okay. In the bid documents themselves. This would get sent out to people. The, overall package sits in your office or sits where it's publicly available, but the contract bid's gonna have these items in. You're gonna have your design approval documents. Who's the stamper? Okay, so yeah, we got everything. Good job, okay. Yep, we did, got everything on the list, cool. Now, the contract bid documents, okay. There is an electronic system for doing all of this for the specifications and drawings. The key here is the specifications and drawings have to meet New York State DOT specifications. There is the possibility of having your own spec. It has to be approved in advance by New York State DOT. Um, it's not a quick process. So if you think you're gonna do something that's not in the state spec, then you better start that process sooner rather than later, okay? You need to know where the right-of-way is. The contractor knows I can't go beyond this point. 
because you don't want them working off the right of way. That creates all kinds of great problems for things, okay? So keep that in mind. You've got to have all the federal provisions in the documents. This includes uh, prevailing wage rates and WIC's law, especially if you're doing building work where it's required, okay? It could include alternative bid processes if you have that proved ahead of time, okay? So keep that in mind. These are all things that have to be done. How you're getting paid or payment methods is part of it too. Yeah, good idea, okay? So these are important things to think about. Now, somebody's asked a question. If it's already city or state property, will the state DOT check this off automatically or do you need to fill up right away forms? That's part of your package that you're gonna be submitting for clearance. If you can show you've already got the right of way, that would be, you would still submit that information. If you need to submit paper proof that you've got that. That's what really comes down to. You don't have to do special form, but you have to prove in writing you've got something, okay? And somebody says that uh, DOT specs can be quite specific. Yeah, yeah, they can be, but the contractors, they know those specs. They may claim they don't, but they know those specs pretty well. So I, if you're following New York State specs, contractors know them pretty much down to the letter, okay? Now, some things you cannot put in your contract bid. Keep this in mind. You used to be able to say, without a doubt, no proprietary items. Now there's a big asterisk, okay? It's no longer disallowed. You can have some proprietary items, but there are restrictions. New York State has its own restrictions above the federal ones, okay? Again, locals are allowed to have additional restrictions, state more than federal. Main thing, if you've got proprietary, get approval ahead of time. Make sure everybody is signed off that, yep, we can do this, okay? You can't do warranties on a, a federal job, okay? You're not gonna be warranting things. You're not gonna retain money. You can't do that, can't hold money back, okay? Your language cannot conflict with the federal requirements. And if you're not sure, ask and have somebody look it over, okay? So you have to do that kind of thing, okay? So keep that in mind. Federal aid is competitive bidding, okay? It's, you're, you're doing essentially low price, okay? It's a competitive bid kind of system. So we're not going to be doing uh, something where we're doing a best value like we would for consultants. The building itself is competitive bidding, okay? Now, you could do force account. You can do it yourself within certain limitations, but that has to be pre-approved by NYSDOT Federal Highway. So maybe you want to do some force account work on a bridge project where maybe you do a little approach work and then the contractor does the rest. You could do that if it's pre-approved and you have to show there's a public interest and it's cost effective to do so. Okay, so keep that in mind. So just be aware of that. And somebody did ask what's considered proprietary items. These are things that are only made by one manufacturer, okay? So that the only person you can buy it is somebody who has a, a patent on it, okay? That's proprietary. You can only buy X from X, okay? You, you can't do that. You have to really be able to have more than one bidder. And that would be only one possible bidder if you had a proprietary item. And that's why there's a process you have to go through if you wanna do that. So keep that in mind, okay? Um, and there may be some mobilization uh, issues, but that's in the contract, that's in the language, okay? Um, and if somebody, and the person said, what about proprietary items with different vendors? Well, again, that's why there is a process if you wanna get it approved and you'll have to get pre-approval for that, talk to the state, talk to the RLPL and they'll work you through the process, okay? And we'll come back to change orders here in a little bit when somebody says, asked about change orders, okay? Let's make sure I didn't miss anything that I'm not going to get to. Under what situation would force account not be cost effective compared to competitive bid? Well, when a local agency can't do it for less and can't show they can do it for less. I know of a city that used to do their own curb work until they actually calculated their own cost and they were three times the cost of the contract. That wouldn't be cost effective. 
So that work, if it were a federal aid job, would have to go to contract because the local agency can't do it cost effectively. That's what would happen in there. And that's why you have to have pre-approval. You have to show that information, okay? Um, just so you know, by the way, design build is not allowed on local projects, okay? There may be some exceptions, okay? I know New York City, somebody is going, but wait, wait, New York populations above a certain amount have some require allowed to do some local things. That's going to be up to procedures that you've worked out with the state and the feds and you have pre-approval on. But unless you have that in writing, assume design build is not allowed. Easiest way to remember it. Okay. Design build is currently not allowed. Should we have it? That's a different question for a different class for a different day. Now, there are some non-typical things, just a quick reminder. You may need a public interest finding if you're using, not just like enforce, you know, force account work, if you're using state or public agency furnished materials. You know, if you're getting an old bridge from somewhere else, like the Tap and Z panels, you might need to have public interest finding. The specifying the use of the proprietary stuff. If you're doing a storage or disposal site that's in a different location, but you're still paying for it with the federal aid, you're gonna to need to make sure that there's some public interest involved in this case. And again, normally warranties are not allowed. There are some exceptions, but those have to be approved ahead of time. And there's not for the whole project, it's specific things, okay? Now there are lots of other contract issues that we can deal with. In fact, there's one that's been sitting in the Q&A we're gonna start with that is a pretty important one. It's called Buy America, okay? Now, what Buy America is really talking about, okay, is iron and steel, okay, or steel and iron, okay? What essentially it says is you need to buy American-made iron or steel. Foreign material has to be limited to less than 0.1% of the contract or $2,500, whichever is greater, okay? So if you've got a $2.2 million contract, you calculate that out, 0.1% is only 2,200. So you could actually have up to 2,500 because that would control, okay? So up to $2.5 million or less, the $2,500 controls above that, it would be 0.1%, a pretty small amount of foreign steel, maybe some special fitting, some special piece of iron or steel. Other than that, it needs to be done with American products, okay? So, and the question is, can you use a product with steel from the United States assembled in Canada? Well, remember, that's part of that 0.1%, okay? The steel's made here, you add up all the steel prices, but you're making it, that's still you're buying that product. It's part of the making it, okay? So does that wind up being under that? Now, can you get a waiver? Yes, you can get a waiver. The waiver has to be approved ahead of installation, okay? And the schedule is not the driver. You can't go, well, be faster. No, no, it has to be based upon economic or unavailable otherwise kind of things. So when do you consider it? Well, I hate to say it, you need to go all the way back to the design phase. You really need to be doing it much greater, okay? So the challenge you're gonna have is when you start generating foreign steel or making foreign steel, it's part of the cost. You have to calculate that in. So be very aware of that. And people go, well, I can get a Buy America waiver. I get a daily thing on federal register stuff that's done and the Buy America waivers pop up on a regular basis. No. I had seen three in the last three months by America waivers. Uh, they don't happen very often. So, you know, it really comes down to steel and iron, bridge beams, rebar, iron railing, steel railing, playground equipment. If it's made of iron, it's made of steel, gotta be made in the US. Keep domestic is what they're talking about, okay? So there's a question in here about altering. I'll have Amanda throw it into the Q&A. We'll ask Federal Highway about it. Um, but generally, if it's iron or steel, try to get it domestically made, okay? Q 
There's some things in here about our manhole covers are important ones in New York City now. Um, FHWA grant, I think I'll have to throw that one uh, dealing with New York City manholes into the q and I'm not quite sure the answer on that one either. So Amanda will move that over. Um, and it has the new bill or IAJA change things. Again, we'll have to throw that in the Q&A because I, I don't know enough about that yet. I'm not an expert on that. I'm not sure. Uh, I definitely want FHWA to uh, comment on that. And would you have to indemnify a contractor if you give them panels say, that were used? Well, of course you would. <laughs> you have to sign off that they're engineered. Okay, there still needs to be an engineering stamp. Okay. And uh, someone said here, Buy America is a tall order for some fittings required by certain local agencies. Well, if you're specking something that's not in the state spec, you're going to have to get prior approval for it. And you better do that ahead of time in the design phase or early, early, early. Okay. And someone did note New York City now has domestically available manhole covers. Okay. Civil rights reporting has to be done. There's a process for this. Okay. It's in uh, LPM chapter 13. This includes DBE, Equal Employment Opportunity of DB Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. Okay. It's actually pretty well spelled out. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's some pretty good checklist. The main thing I want to point out to you, and I want you to keep this in mind, is New York State has its own program that you'll have heard about called Minority and Women-Owned Business Enterprise, W, excuse me, MWBE. That's a state program. There cannot be any of those goals on the federal aid projects. They are separate programs. MWBE is when there's state dollars, federal dollars use DBE, okay? So keep that in mind, okay? The DBE goals, well, the goals are based upon the type of work involved and where you are in the state, okay? It comes down to the availability of work. Is there an opportunity for DBE companies to be able to get the work? Is it available to them? If there's a challenge, then you need to find a way to give them a goal. It's based upon the percentage of the bid, okay? So for instance, if the bid is 1,000 and the DBE commitment is 100, then that's a 10%, okay, that you would be going towards. Once the contract is let, it's based upon the percentage of the bid in terms of monitoring progress. And it's the dollar amount that you calculate that's the end of it. So if it's a 10% commitment, it'd be $100. Now, generally the EEO, the Equal Opportunity Goals for females, you know, women, it's 6.9%. The minority goal is based upon the county. And yes, they are looking at those, they're always looking at these numbers, they may change. So don't, don't go, oh, this is what it is. This is what it is now, it may change. So before you start your project, ask, because it might have changed. And especially the minority goals are based upon county, okay? And so there's a tool available. Nice that has a tool. It's linked inside of the documents that we've given to you. You can find that tool by county. But just to illustrate this, let's do a question. So DBE commitment of 8%, award amount of 500,000, okay? And let's assume that's the exact bid amount too, okay? So the bid is 500,000. What's the amount of money that they're gonna be monitoring it, okay? So somebody's got it here. Uh, while, it, while you're calculating, does the DBA percentage from the original amount include the change orders. If they're significant, it might, but generally no, it's based upon the total of the original award. But again, you wanna monitor these things and talk to people, okay? Can the DBE goal be adjusted? Now, the good news is it's based on the award of the bid amount, okay? That's what you're monitoring it, okay? 
40,000, very good, got your math right. That's good to know, people are good with their math. Okay, okay. Um, but you do wanna keep monitoring, even after you've finished, you still wanna monitor, make sure people are making good progress and continuing trying to use uh, DBEs whenever possible. And by the way, there are some other requirements you may hear about like use of veterans and small businesses on state aid. Remember, state aid is separate from federal aid. So be aware of that, okay? And so, yeah, so you might have an issue with these kind of things. So if it's a big change order, yeah, you may need to include it. Okay, so now let's look at the, some practices to think about. The thing you wanna be looking at with these contractors is it, do they have good recruitment and hiring practices? Are they paying people properly? Um, do they have training? Okay. Are they promoting people who are disadvantaged for whatever? And are they retaining them? These are all things you'd want to be monitoring and looking at. And by the way, it includes not only your prime contractor, but any subcontractors and suppliers. Anyone who's getting money from the federal aid process needs to be part of the whole process. Okay, and somebody asked a question about latest Davis-Bacon wage rates. The Davis-Bacon wage rates, you should try to include the time when the bids are being opened. Those should be the numbers you're including. But obviously, depending on timing, that might not be perfect. And yeah, they're going to be monitored during the course of the project as well. That's always the true case. Okay. Now, sometimes you can't meet the requirements. But sometimes you can, but the key is for DBE is it's got to be commercially useful. Commercially useful essentially is, is it actually something of value to the disadvantaged organization and commercially valuable in terms of productive to the job itself? Okay, there is an evaluation. You're going to be evaluating the workforce. Okay. Is that commercially useful? Is the supervision something where there's DBEs involved, okay? The equipment, are they doing a review of all of that? And of course, the materials themselves. You know, just because they've got a certified firm, um, are the work they're doing, is it commercially useful? And each contract you might have to look at slightly differently. You know, if you're using your own employees, that's good. If you're hiring somebody else to do the work, are they, is that a disadvantaged business or not that they're hiring? So you really need to look at the whole process. The good news is you don't have to remember all this. There's some forms that are available. There's links to them. You don't have to write all these things down. The forms will help you figure out the right questions to ask. So that's the good news. You can just follow through those kind of things. Okay. So that's something you can deal with. And yes, the subs can help you fill out the final numbers, because remember, it's on the total contract. So the subs could help you out. In a lot of cases, in fact, companies will hire a sub who is a DBE to help fulfill that need, both in the contract and in the consulting side of the house. So keep that in mind, okay? And somebody asked, uh, if Davis-Bacon rates are lower than New York State prevailing wage, why do we need to monitor Davis-Bacon wage rate? Because uh, things change. So you just want to monitor and make sure that you know that they are lower. If they're lower, you're done. Yay. But you're also making sure people got paid. Okay. So let's do a quick case study on DBE and then we're going to move on. Uh, DBE is subcontracted to furnish and install rebar on a bridge deck. A review of documents submitted with the material certification shows the steel was delivered and invoiced to the prime contractor. The documentation indicates what? It indicates the DBA negotiated price and ordered rebar. Further review is required. The DBA only needs to submit proof of payment to demonstrate a commercially useful function, or the DBA did not perform a commercially useful function. Now, I didn't give you enough, and this happens <laughs> where you know they submit something and it's like, I don't think I know enough. That's actually probably the biggest thing. A lot of times when we put the, these things together, there's more detail that's needed. I know we all don't like to see all the paperwork, but part of the reason is, is that we wanna make sure we have enough documentation so we can know that it was commercially useful and they were actually meeting the requirements that were in the contract. Okay, so keep that in mind, okay. 
that go from there. So our calculation of a commercially useful function for subcontractors, generally it's hundred percent. There are some exceptions where it's less, but you know, it's most of the work counts. Trucking, it's gonna be hundred percent with some caveats, okay? Uh, there may be some exceptions if it's, uh, depending on who the operator and the owner is. And if they're leasing the truck, the leasing might change that percentage because now the leasing is not counted against the DBE, it's counted against the leasing company, which may or may not be a DBE. Uh, regular dealers, um, only 60%. You only get 60% credit when you're dealing with regular dealers, regular companies, okay? Uh, manufacturers, good news there, 100%. If they're a DBE firm, you get 100% credit. And then service providers, um, reasonable fees and commissions. So essentially the key is make sure you're calculating what's commercially useful and not everything counts in every single case. Okay, so just keep that in mind as we, as we start thinking about these kind of things. So, okay. So good faith efforts. Um, let's say you can't get a goal. You just can't get anybody to bid, okay? So <clears throat> in, you know, you're having a hard time meeting good faith effort, or the contractor is. What do you do? What kinds of things can you do to show you've got good faith looking for DBE firms and you just can't find them? So throw into the poll everywhere some examples of good faith efforts. Things that, yeah, document the phone calls, emails, and responses. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, good idea. Advertise. Yeah, essentially communication. You got to communicate. You got to have a log. Okay, I've done this process. Easiest way to do it is to set yourself up a paper or spreadsheet version of a log and document everything who you called, when you called, who you emailed, when you emailed, what the replies are and show that I'm trying to really get a good faith effort. I'm trying to reach out to DBEs in the area and I'm just not getting, it. okay? And yeah, documented proof, okay? Any backup, just make a big file. But again, by doing it on a piece of paper, that's a log, you've really got good information, okay? Now let's assume that you didn't quite get enough good faith effort. You really have done this, but you know you still gonna keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Even after you've got an award, you can keep going, looking for firms to help with subcontracting, to help with getting parts, manufacturing of goods, things like that. You're gonna continue it until you meet the requirements and beyond. Don't stop. Keep looking for new firms. We're always looking for small firms. We find a few here, even with our work we do with the LTAP Center. There's always new firms coming out there, but they gotta be new efforts. Don't go call them back to company A that you've called 15 times. Start calling a few others, okay? See what else is out there. Maybe there's some new firms, okay? Now, all of this starts to lead to something called a construction management plan. Before you actually build things, you're gonna to be together something called a CMP, okay? That's gonna include documentation from the state, there's a whole bunch of manuals they've got. They're linked in your handout called the MERC, the Manual of Uniform Record Keeping and State Specs and things like that. The uh, easiest thing to do is meet with the RLPL and sit down and you're gonna develop a plan with project milestones in it, okay? And it's not a hard process, but it's important to do. Again, this whiteboard brainstorming concept. You're going to develop your quality assurance, quality control procedures, QA, QC, okay? You're going to open up this thing called the Merck. This Manual of Uniform Record Keeping essentially is a document that can help you figure out what you need to have in terms of milestones, procedures for construction, okay? Now, it's much like before we did a Sunday, imagine you're doing dinner. Same concept, our Sunday or our dinner. You're gonna build essentially your project from soup to nuts or soup to dessert. 
What are the steps so we don't miss something as we go along? Now, I want to highlight two issues out of here that are pretty important. One of them is quality assurance, quality control. It's not quit asking, quit checking, okay? And I, I hear people go QA, QC. I hear people go QC, QA. Not as common, but I do see them do that. The concept, think about it, is quality control is sort of numbers. Quality assurance is process. But you can also, some people like to look at it as the quality of the contractor and the quality of the agency or by the agency. So the quality of the contractor, you're doing it with numbers, densities, amounts, materials, quantities, uh, strength, things like that. Quality by the agency is to ensure that the contractor did roll that asphalt a certain number of times, did feather it properly or put in the material that they needed for the joint, things like that. So quality of the contractor, quality of the agency. And as part of the CMP, you're gonna develop a quality assurance program that's gonna include inspection, sampling and testing and certification and documentation. And you just, you have a laundry list of things then that you can use to make sure you've met all the standards that you need to meet. So as an example, what might you include for quality assurance for say concrete? I'm gonna be pouring a concrete deck on my rehabbed bridge. And what am I gonna to wanna to necessarily do? Yeah, temperature slump for the concrete before it's placed, yeah, okay. What else? Air, we worry about air a lot, freezing and thawing environments, yeah. Strength of the cylinder test over time, minimum of you know, three or four up to 28 days. If it did a curing procedure or curing material, what's included? Yeah. If there's any steel, was it placed properly? Did we actually measure it before we poured the concrete? You don't want to do it after. <laughs> you don't want to have to take cores, okay? If you're going to avoid it. Any admixtures, was it pumped? What was the air temperature? What was the ground temperature possibly? What was the weather? All the tickets, yeah. So you can imagine doing that again for each of your items quality assurance. The good thing is you can actually use a lot of stuff that's already been done. The plants, for instance, for concrete are already tested by the state on an annual basis. So really only you've got to worry about is individual stuff. But you want to put together a plan. Um, if you're on the national highway system or a state highway, you're following state specs, you've got state inspectors, and you're going to have only worry about quality assurance offsite the materials coming in and your steel. Okay. So, pretty simple. If you're on the national highway system or state highway, maybe you're in an intersection or something like that. So, that one's actually probably a little bit easier. When you get off system, i.e., most of our projects, you got to be following New York state specs, but you may not have New York state DOT inspection. The plant may not have an inspector. You may have to provide your own. That's the bad news. The good news is if you included it way back there in the scoping phase, in the beginning, or even better yet, when you got your money, it is eligible for federal reimbursement if you've got the money available. So you want to include it in your scope way back at the beginning so that you can get paid for if you have to hire inspectors. It's eligible. Okay. So what are some critical documents that we need to have in our construction management plan? And we did a, by the way, just so you know, we did a three-day session on the construction management process. So we're just touching on the little bit of the surface of our iceberg. But you got to have a schedule. You got to have contact information. Yeah. You probably need an organization chart. Somebody threw in the QA, QC in there as well chain of command, who's in charge, yep, okay. So you can imagine all the critical documents and then you can even rank them. You can click on and pick the most important things. I see schedules getting a lot of votes. Contact information is up there. Cost is gonna be in there, our estimated cost, yep, okay. There's a list in chapter 15 of the printed documents from the state that you should also be reviewing, such as the steel construction manual and the specifications. But the key here is, you know, you're not alone. 
A lot of people go, oh man, it seems overwhelming. Again, go find that RLPL, pick up the phone, have a conversation. Great liaisons will help you out and help you make the process succeed, okay? We're getting close, by the way. We're about to uh, actually build things. You're gonna get one more authorization to go to construction, okay? Again, don't go there until you get to your uh, actual bidding items like that, okay? So be careful about that. Now you're gonna be doing an advertisement for bids. That bid advertisement is obviously going to have to include any DBE goals that you've calculated before when you did your uh, construction management plan and your PSNE. You're going to need to include any kind of project numbers that are assigned from DOT, the name, the description, the owner. When are you going to open them up? Date and time and location. Where can they get the documents? And where can they submit the bids? Okay. And if there's a bid deposit or security required, that would be where you would include it. And finally, who to contact for questions and if there are any restrictions on what they can ask about. There may be in some cases, so be aware of that, okay? So something to keep in mind, and there's more. You can place this in the New York State Contract Reporter, okay? In fact, you need to, okay? I get the uh, answers for that that are related to highway every day just to see what's coming out. It's actually a pretty fun read to see the variety of things that's out there. Every consultant and every big contractor does the same. They've got a broader list than I do. Um, you should do your local newspaper, probably some ones nearby, okay? And you have to have three weeks. You can't do a two-week bid. I know a lot of times we'll do a two-week bid on local projects. Federal aid, got to have three weeks. Give them four. If you can, really, really good to give them an extra week. It really helps, especially depending on the time of year. Anytime you make an amendment, and that's okay, we can do amendment. Obviously need to reestablish this, send it to anybody who's bid and a copy of the New York State DOT if you have to make a change and amendment, okay? And are there specific rules? Yeah, these are laid out in the local projects manual, what the steps are, okay? So that's uh, something to keep in mind. And someone asked from a question before, if you need to get reimbursed, does the inspection lab have to be procured using the same kind of requirements we did for consultants and other contractors? Yep. You'll need to use the same processes. Um, it's a professional service in this case, but yeah, you'll still need to be using, thinking about some kind of qualified based selection, okay? And uh, can underrun items, uh, Someone wants to talk about change items. I'm gonna leave that question. We'll come back to uh, that in just a couple of minutes with change orders anyway. So let's build this thing, okay? So let's build our structure and that's twice, okay? So now we're in construction, okay? Now in terms of construction, this is LPM chapter 14. We're opening up the bids. They have to be done publicly. And remember, low bid low bid, but you can evaluate to make sure that they're responsible. You know, you look at the low bid and you're like, wait a second, they're off on their quantities or there's a bit mismatched bid. There's a process involved, but you can evaluate that. Can they really meet the requirements? Be careful if you're throwing someone out there, you got to have good reasons to do so. Make sure they've got a DBE plan. And that's when you need approval from New York State DOT. If they don't have the percentage met, they have five additional days to either get more data to fill that out or to do a good faith effort. Okay, so only have five days, which is why, again, if you give them four weeks, that gives them a little bit more time to get their good faith effort in place. You can't negotiate. It's uh, use them or lose them, but uh, you can't negotiate. Now, once you get the thing started, you have to monitor for civil rights. There's a process called EBO, okay, that you put in to monitor both EEO monitoring and DBE monitoring. We actually use it on our contract with New York State DOT for the LTEP Center. We are putting things into EBO, even though there's a zero percentage requirement. Um, you still be putting, you still wanna put those data in. They still want to know, even if there's no requirement, you still need to be filling these data out, okay? So 
no matter what the goal is, you need to be putting this information in and recording it. And any changes in that need to be communicated. And again, pick up the phone, talk to the RLPL and go from that, okay? Now, somebody asked, does the contract need to be unit price? Well, no, it needs to be low price. How you set that up is something you're gonna to have to set up in your contract documents. Unit is the most common, but you know it could be project, okay? And who's completing the EBO? Well, the local sponsor is required to be the one you know, in charge, but you could have your contractor do it or your consultant do it, your inspecting engineering firm that you hire. Um, but the responsible party is essentially the local agency to fill that out. The contractor would be doing the direct filling it out, but it comes back to the agency. But the contractor usually fills out their own stuff and you monitor it, okay? There's a process. Um, there's a workforce participation plan that you put in everybody's position. Again, you put all this data in. It's really done in design, by the way. This is actually done way back in design and then you're just gonna modify it. And EBO is, uh, it's a monitoring of business operations, okay? Employment business opportunities for everybody, but they're really looking at it for disadvantaged groups for a variety of reasons. The award is submitted to the DOT, okay? There's a form for that. Again, you don't have to remember all these things. You can just look up them in the form, okay? And you be, should be in pretty good shape there, okay? And then you construct. Yay, we're building now, okay? Now, in terms of constructing and inspecting the project, what I wanna end our hour with, and we're gonna come back for a little bit on construction and then talk about uh, some conclusions before our Q&A panel. But just think about it. You've built projects, every one of you, whether you have federal aid or not. What are the kind of problems you've had during construction? Weather. Oh, yeah, that's number one. Environmental conditions. Unforeseen unknowns. Utilities. Railroad issue. Right-of-way. Hazardous materials. A vault you didn't know about, an overrun on cost. Surprise, no one's put in inflation yet. Okay, inflation's definitely gonna rear its ugly head this year, okay? Think about these construction problems. How many of these construction problems actually could have been resolved with a good design approval document and or a really good construction management plan, okay? That's why it's really important, if you can, to have a good plan in place. A lot of these problems, not all, will go away, okay? Or at least they'll be minimized. And yes, I know, people wanna change things in the middle, you can get political issues, but again, this is why it's so important to have a good plan and why we actually have a requirement for a pre-construction conference. Sponsor is there, the contractor is there, if you've hired an inspection firm, they're there. If not, your local people who are doing the inspection need to be there and the RLPL from the state. And you sit down and you have a pre-construction meeting. Heck, we should have a pre-construction meeting on every job, not just our federal aid jobs. It's a really good idea to go through and sort of what's the game plan for today's event, okay? We're gonna run the quarterback. Are we gonna run the wide receiver? It's the same concept pre-construction. And I wanna end with a reminder about two things. One is construction safety. Make sure you've got your PPE, you're ready for the job, okay? In my case, it was cold, I was ready for the cold. Are you ready for the proper construction safety? Do you have that part of your plan, okay? And do you have your inspection plan in place, okay? And we're gonna stop now, we're gonna take our break, we're going to come back and finish our thing on construction inspection on slide 187 for those who are counting along. And uh, there are a couple of questions in the q and I'll come and answer them or the ones you've got as we come out of break. Okay, so you can put in your questions that you've got and we will be back.
at two o'clock. See you then. I can do this one. Okay, not very well, but I can do it. See you at two o'clock.
Okay, we're going to start back up. Um, one more chance to put in some questions, though we're getting a lot in the Q&A, so that's a cool way to do it as well. So, you know, um, don't worry about it. We'll get your questions, Andrew. We'll be doing that poll as soon as we get to the last of the slides. And let's see if my technology works. Nope, typed in the wrong number somehow. Oh, I see what I did. I typed in 100,000. That's not going to work too well. Uh, so, so let's finish up construction and then uh, we can move on to the poll. Uh, there's a few questions in the Q&A. They're typing some answers in, some of the panel members already. Um, but we'll make sure we get to those questions uh, during the Q&A as well. Construction and inspection essentially is done by the sponsor uh, with, again, that resident engineer or that AIC engineer in charge. Um, you're going to have some field inspector, inspectors. The number needed varies upon the size of the project. There's a nice table in the uh, LPM that will tell you that. You don't have to memorize that number, look it up. Um, you'll notice there's half personnel listed. That just means you have a half-time person, not a full-time person required. Um, you don't have to cut somebody in half. That would be a really good magic trick, but not good for inspector. Um, you're following the state inspection. But again, if you've got something else that's been pre-approved, this means you're going to be looking at shop drawings that are especially things that are approved for structural work. So really, that's the job of the inspector. A lot of times, again, you're hiring somebody to do that work. This includes, by the way, contract administration, collecting of tickets, documentation of the work that you're getting. Um, some people are like, well, yeah, but that's expensive. Well, it guarantees you've got good quality and workmanship. And if you do a good job, it's good for records management later on to know what you've got to keep long-term and what you can just file after a few years. So record documentation is management is pretty important. These people act as coordination going on the job site. And again, this provides assurance to the FHWA that the project is clear and you can see what's going on. Um, that's an important process, especially the DOT's inspections where they come out and they look at the project. But if you've done a good job with your own local inspections and you can provide that documentation to NISDOT when they show up, it really helps make sure that we're getting what we paid for and that we're not hiding or missing something later on. Now, the thing I wanna make sure we all understand when it comes to the job of the inspector, the job of the inspector, everybody says, well, they're observing what's going on. Well, yeah, you're observing conditions. You're observing, did they meet the criterion in the construction management plan, the PSNE, the specifications? Um, you know, you wanna make sure that that's being done properly. Yeah, that's the job of the inspector. You're writing down the causes and the effects of what's going on. But they're not just there to document. Uh, a lot of times we just think, oh, the job of the inspector is to observe things. But they really should be looking at getting information to the sponsor or even the contractor to say, hey, look, we got to make things better. They got to talk to the IC and make recommendations for improvements. You know, if you see a cone in the middle of the road being built, you can't just leave it there. Just don't document, hey, there's a cone in the middle of the road about to get buried. See something, do something, you know? Oh, there's a panel out of position. Well, that's not the job of the inspector. The job of the inspector is to get the best bang for the buck. And to do that, they need to communicate and make sure that things are improved when they can be improved. Way too often, we've heard about the fact that inspectors are just documenting problems. And then six months later, somebody's reading through the reports and that's when they realize, oh, they forgot a bolt or they replaced a grade nine bolt with one that's a different grade. So see something, say something, okay? Let's spend a little bit of time on change orders. Uh, this is uh, in chapter 15, it's, it's its own section. It's important enough that I wanna make sure we spend some time on it. A change order, you'll sometimes hear the term order on contracts, similar thing, they're not different, okay? It's just the terminology difference that we're dealing with, okay? Change orders are allowed, but some have to be pre-approved and some really aren't legitimate when it comes to what the contractor is asking for, okay? We don't want a situation like this where the original contract's little boat and the big boat's the change orders alone. So help me out. 
in the uh, poll everywhere, once my slide decides it wants to move forward, give me some legitimate change order items. So unknown field conditions, maybe a time extension. There was an item missing on the plans that they noted. Yeah, okay. Budget, hmm. If your budget's off, you might have to do a change order, but is that something feds are gonna pick up? Okay. Asbestos, should you have caught that during the initial inspection? Okay. A quantity overrun. Why was there a quantity overrun? You know, so think about these things. Are these really things that should have been caught early on, should have been in the plans and specifications? Or is it something that, yeah, we, we didn't hit it? You know, a utility work causing you to slow down. Yeah, that could be a legitimate time change order, but isn't it economic change order? So think about that. You know, a contract change, okay, is a change to the scope, okay? Um, and if it's a change in the scope, really it should have been caught back in the scope at the beginning. A contract change is a change in cost. Not a minor thing, but a major thing, okay? So when there's changes to the plans, there's changes to the specs, we're looking at change orders. If we have to modify an item, okay, that's gonna be something we have to think about. If you have to adjust the payments because of the contract, then you might have to do a change order. But really you wanna avoid these as much as you possibly can. Because, you know, yes, unforeseen conditions say utility, that requires a change. You're not gonna get the price you wanted. There's no bidding involved anymore. Now it's negotiation. And so you're gonna deal with that. So change orders get us in trouble. Now we've all learned in school or who, what, where, when, why, and how, you remember that? When it comes to change orders, just like in terms of uh, Simon Sinek says, start with the why. Why is the change necessary? If it's necessary, then what is the change and how will it impact the scope, the design, and who's responsible and who should pay? Try to limit your change orders. You know, if you aren't careful, they can run up some things. There's a process to prepare them using the Merck, okay? There's actually a form for that. You should be doing that for federal aid projects. You submit it and it's reviewed by the NICE doc, okay? And you're gonna need to get prior approval in many cases, okay? When there's a major change. Now, some that don't need that, minor changes within the scope. We're adding a small amount of concrete that's non-structural, yeah. Uh, small quantity increases and decreases that aren't significant. A new item that's not really significant. Changes within the field that, again, minor. If you're not sure if they need requirements, easiest thing to do, <laughs> pick up the phone and talk to the RLPL, okay? Um, you know, can you have an overrun? What percentage someone wants to know? Do you permit 125% overrun at the same price and negotiate? I'd say 25% overrun is something that's a change order and you're gonna have to get permission and, and organize that. That's not just a small increase in quantity, okay? And again, if you're not sure, talk to the RLPL, they can help you out. Um, and they can actually act a little bit of a club too. They can help say, hey, nope, we gotta do it this way. There's a procedure. What we don't want to do is just the contractor just adds on and on and on. That's not good for anybody, okay? The single most important thing when it comes to change orders, well, the three most important things are communicate, 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 okay? More than anything else, you've got to communicate. And again, we could spend a whole hour just on change orders or orders on contracts. We've already talked a little bit about reimbursement, but a couple of reminders as we get towards the end of our time before the Q&A panel. 
Um, all the reimbursements have to be done against an active PIN number, which is assigned by the state, and only eligible work gets paid. So if it's not in the scope, if it's not in the PSNE, if it's not in a change order, not in the contract, not going to get reimbursed. You have to have proof of payment, okay? Not the invoice, but proof the invoice has been paid. A canceled check, a bank transfer, payment, okay? There is a reporting requirement that has to be followed. And you need to make sure you're meeting your EEO, your equal opportunity goals or your DBE goals, and you're making progress towards those. The good news is you can get progress payments and the state actually does these generally monthly. Now that's good. It includes any work performed, it may include stockpile items as long as they're in a secure location and you, you know they're going to be used on that project only. You know, a big pile of sand, maybe not, unless it's inside the confines of the job site. Okay. The EIC, the resident engineer, is going to prepare an estimate and then that's going to be submitted on a timely basis. Because remember, the contractor has to pay their subcontractors fairly quickly. So you really want to make sure you're doing the same getting in time the reimbursement request because you want that money from the state and they want it from the feds. We don't want to be doing it on an inactive project, so it has to be active um, and we we'll make sure we're in compliance. Biggest thing when it comes to reimbursement, if there's issues, speak up, say something. Okay, and by the way, that's true with anything. If there's an issue, pick up the phone. If it's really severe, we might have to go to the ultimate step. But before we do that, we'll talk about that ultimate step to finish up here, just about a couple more things. We can actually develop something called a corrective action plan. Yes, I know we have two CAPs. This is a different one. This is a corrective action plan where you would say, look, we're behind schedule or we're not meeting the requirements long before we get into any kind of pulling money away. We wanna develop a plan to fix the problem. The real goal here is to win the game. Three X's, three O's, whatever we're trying to do. That means we may set up some additional auditing, monitoring. We may want to do one of these financial reviews, these fire reviews. This is going to involve bringing in federal highway. But they're actually, in this case, they want you to succeed as a local sponsor. They want the contractor to get the work done properly as a local sponsor. Okay, So keep that in mind. What we want to avoid is something called a FANE. A FANE stands for, well, financial uh, federal ineligibility notice. Okay, so we're going to come back to FANEs in just a second. Now, in terms of compliance enforcement, well, something we have to think about. A federal aid ineligibility notice. Mm, FANE. I mean, we don't want to see a FANE. Okay. A faint occurs when essentially you're going to be pulling money back. We don't want to do that. It's chapter three, you can read it. The main thing is if you see something, say something, correct it as quickly as you possibly can. So I'm just going to show a couple of brief examples. There's lots more as we can show. I don't want you to be worried about faints. They do occur, but they occur usually because somebody saw something and either didn't say something and it got buried, didn't say something and somebody got hurt, or didn't correct a problem when they had an opportunity to do so, okay? Fix the problems when you see them, and usually DOT and Federal Highway will work with you to get you what you need, okay? So do you see a problem here? Can you throw that in the Q&A for me, okay? What do you see as a possible pain problem here? There's about three that I very easily can see on this particular site. Lack of personal protective equipment. Uh, the rebar, why is some rebar coated and some isn't? That's probably not in the spec that way. And there should have been caps on that from a safety standpoint. You're gonna notice something. Safety tends to be a pretty big issue, okay? Uh, curing things, is it structurally correct is a pretty big issue. Don't do those kind of things, okay? Again, you gotta have vest on. Even though you think I'm not the road, uh, you're in a right of way. 
because there's a bridge there, you need to have on the safety vest. You need to have on the proper stuff protecting the stream, okay? What we don't want is situations where you don't do your inspections, you don't have your records. Instead of pulling the money, what they might say is, okay, we won't pull the money. What we're gonna do is we're gonna ask you to do cores on your concrete to make sure that the concrete meets the requirements. And in this particular case, the picture we got sent to us, the project was only a $50,000 project, but the cost of bringing the company out to core, to test, to refill everything wound up being $40,000 out of a $50,000 project. We don't want that, okay? An easy way to think about this, by the way, this is not a pain problem. It's just a pretty picture at Buttermilk Falls State Park, but make sure you think of safety and certification and structure any engineering stuff. You do that and communicate, you're probably gonna be okay. And by the way, things do happen afterwards. Is this a vein problem? Well, it's actually heaving that occurred six months after the sidewalk was placed. Project might be closed out, but even if it's not a vein problem, we should be thinking about improving as much as we can. We don't wanna see problems like this later on during construction. And again, we could spend a whole bunch of time on fanes, but I agree with the folks at DOT. We're not gonna focus on them. We wanna focus on you being successful. So we're gonna close the project out. Um, to do this, we're gonna have a final inspection. That final inspection, you're gonna at least invite folks from the DOT to come by for the final inspection that you're gonna conduct, okay? You're gonna schedule the RLPL to come by. Uh, but they may not come by for the inspection with the contractor, but they're going to come by at some point to look everything over, and they're going to do a contract closeout. Okay? There's a nice checklist. You don't have to memorize this. There's actually a really nice checklist in the LPM. You just check, check, check to see what's in there. Okay? That documentation tells you whether you have to do a final reimbursement request or when you can do it. Your final acceptance forms. If it's on the state highway, the state signs off. You need as-built plans, by the way. Anything that's a bridge, anything on the national highway system or the state highway system. You're gonna have a financial summary of the project. Again, you don't have to memorize all of this. If you have a project more than uh, $750,000, you're gonna to have to have an audit, a federal single audit. In fact, if you're getting multiple projects that add up to more than three quarters of a million dollars, you're gonna to have to have some auditing done. So you're gonna to need to know when that's done. You may have to have an audit on your consultant if you're paying them quite a bit of money too as well. And of course, any final reports. Again, the nice thing is just to show you there's a lot that has to be done, but you don't have to remember it. The reports are listed in that nice form. You can just review it. It's linked pretty well. You know, things like DBE and EEO utilization. Did you pay the prime contractor? Did you play the subcontractor? And here it is. And now I know you're like, I can't read it. Yeah, I know. Don't try to read it. The form is on the web. It's linked in your handout. And it's an easy way to remember what has to be done. Okay. Now, a couple of things, the final points to point out here. You're going to be reviewing the project records. You're going to make sure the work has been done. Uh, during the final inspection, you may be doing a final punch list of things that have to be cleaned up before the project can be closed. So be careful. Ensure before you say the project is done that there are no outstanding claims. If you've still got a punch list of items to finish, you're not done. Okay, don't go ahead and sign up. Hold that project open. Don't let it get closed. And I know the accountants want to close the project. But remember, once it's closed, you can't go back and get the funds. If there's work to be done and finished work, wait, hold, okay? If there's a pending issue, just be patient. You can close it out. Paper's not going to go anywhere. It's not running away, okay? So keep that in mind. So with that, I think, yep, final voucher. The very final voucher, New York State DOT is going to be submitting it to get their final payment. You've already gotten all your money. FHWA does its final review. And once they've done a final voucher approved, funds are paid, everybody's happy. Now, one last thing. You've got to keep records. 
we got to keep them longer than we probably like. Um, they just updated the records retention rules at the state archives. So there's actually some brand new rules out there. We actually put up one of our little uh, deeper digs on that, dealing with that. Generally, keep it longer than you think. Three years minimum for any paperwork on a federal aid project, 10 years if it's on the national highway system, okay? Good way to think about it, just keep it for 10 years and then you don't have to worry about it. Anything that's related to the structure, anything that's related to the layout of the actual roadway, you're keeping those forever because they're associated with the structure or with the roadway. But the paperwork of payments and things like that, give yourself 10 years, you'll be happy. There are some exceptions. In fact, if you've got state aid, Marcielli funding, you may actually have to hold it even longer. There's a new EIB that came out, or EB that came out, that actually requires, because of some tax rules that, you know, we've got to keep things 15 months for some things, okay, but 36 years for others. Um, so that may be pretty much the life of the structure. So if you're not sure, find a place to restore it. You can do a lot of this electronically these days that not take up so much space. There may be audits, audits are fine. Everybody gets worried about audits. My wife hates whenever she gets an audit notice. We've gotten three in our marriage. It's never come to anything and I'm not worried, but you know, we all worry about audits. Audits are usually done by the state, a federal highway, but any other federal agency may audit as well. So just be aware of that. If you've got good documentation, if you've kept good records, you shouldn't have to worry about it too much. It really isn't a big issue. And then of course, you're gonna operate and maintain it. Um, Essentially, this is a great time to just remind yourself, what are you gonna be doing for maintenance? Since we've been doing a lot on bridges, we'll stick with the bridge things. What kind of maintenance activities are you gonna be doing on a bridge? What kind of maintenance activities are we gonna be doing on a bridge? You're gonna be painting, you're gonna be deck sealing, you're probably gonna plow in the winter, washing and painting, clean the drainage off that was in the Q&A, fix the joints, Salting. When you build that project in your head before you get all started, think about the maintenance activities. Could you have done something during the construction phase to make the maintenance phase easier or better? And if you can, why not? Put it, think about the whole process because you're going to be maintaining it with your own local funds. Okay. We don't want to get a situation where because we fall down on the maintenance, that it becomes a structural issue for a bridge or a safety issue for a road. So final review. Again, um, most important thing of all, communicate. That's the single most important thing to remember, to communicate. So with one word, where can you go to get assistance? One word. If you do more than one word, it's just going to scatter across. Your RLPL, very good. That's good. I like it. Yep. You go to our website, the LPM. Okay. You can get a hold of us at the LTAP Center here at Cornell. Yep. Talk to your consultants. They all know how to do this. They're pretty good at it. Okay. Okay. Yep. Good. You can talk to the state. The RLPL is one of your best contacts. And Mr. Jack and Mr. Daniels, different kind of assistance, probably not on federal aid, okay? Somebody asked about getting a copy of the presentation slide deck. We've got a recording. We're gonna record up to this end of this section. The actual slide deck itself, um, there's reasons I can share the video, but I can't share the slide deck. But the handouts are all available and they'll be posted on our website and you can download those. Okay, now I just want to end with, before we do the Q&A, just to illustrate the fact federal aid is actually pretty cool. There's some pretty cool projects out there where you need that federal aid, okay? So for instance, in the city of Buffalo, they did Buffalo Niagara Street as a sustainable corridor, pretty expensive project, okay? Um, total project cost was almost 14 million. Most of that was actually local dollars. 
but they got federal and state dollars amounting to over 4 million to help reduce the cost and got some technical advice to help make that project even better. Because you can take advantage of these experts that are available by getting a federal aid project, okay? The town of Yorktown actually restored an old railroad station using some transportation enhancement program money, okay? And the uh, federal monies it covered two thirds of the cost out of a half million dollar project, okay? Of course, bridges are our most common thing. They are by far the most common federal aid project. Um, again, how much is local, how much is federal, how much is state will vary quite a bit. But you know, if it's a $3 million bridge, which it was in this case with the village of Maranac, that'd be really hard for a local agency to cover. You might be able to cover the cash, but they can't just budget for that. But by federal aid, they were able to get the local price down to less than a million dollars. That's something you can think about doing once every 100 years if you design it right. Rail trails obviously are a very common thing, okay? And you know, most projects, you know, federal aid is gonna recover 80% of the project or more. And if you get state aid, it might even drop it less than that. And you, of course, can use it for safety projects. In this case, it's the safety improvement in the Dutchess County and the town of Wappinger, um, where they were actually improving the safety of a whole bunch of intersections and a $9 million project. And the locals in the end of it only paid 6%. So again, think about where you've got situations where there's a big cash issue or you'd like to get some technical help or it's a big project. This is where federal aid can really come in advantage to you, really help you out. And in some cases, the federal aid can help stretch your dollars. And the feds want this because they want a good network. They want everybody to be able to know there's a really good network available, okay? So we're gonna end with, as I wanna go ahead and get to our panel, I'm gonna let you ask one last chance if you have any more questions. We have some that were sent to us ahead of time. We have the ones that are still sitting in the Q&A, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna open it up to our Q&A panel here. We're gonna spend the time from now till three doing that. The part up till now will be recorded and put onto the website. The Q 